for taking place. Uh, we are here to, to remember and uh, to, to celebrate our very good colleague and friend, uh, Emilio Picasso. And uh, the Scuola Normale thought uh, that uh, uh, it was a, a due homage to, to Emilio to uh, organize a scientific uh, gathering uh, that would uh, uh, illustrate one of his uh, major contribution, that is uh, uh, the so-called LEP, Large Electron Positron Collider, which was uh, a, an important uh, uh, project uh, at CERN, which uh, uh, dominated uh, uh, the activity of the laboratory for more than 10 years, the construction, and then uh, an equivalent amount of time uh, for explo exploitation. And uh, uh, we would like to illustrate uh, these two phases uh, through the contribution of uh, some of the, of the main actors uh, of, this, uh, of this period. Uh, I have been told uh, the Mariella Picasso and part of a family that are traveling by car are actually uh, very close to this square. <laughs> they were held up uh, uh, by the traffic uh, near Genova, but now apparently, I hope, uh, without uh, incurring uh, in fines uh, for excess of velocity, they, they have recovered a good part of the delay and they will be here. Uh, in a moment. Uh, well, I, I don't want at this point to uh, uh, talk uh, about uh, Emilio. Uh, maybe uh, there will be intervention uh, this afternoon uh, after the end uh, of the prepare program. But as, uh, at least uh, some of you have had the opportunity to see uh, in, in the back uh, of the uh, leaflet uh, that uh, advertise uh, this meeting. Uh, there is now also <laughs> a, a, a list of the program, and uh, we will have uh, uh, as first speaker uh, Professor Daniele Menozzi, who teaches. Uh, contemporary history, I believe, uh, at, at the school, uh, and uh, who has gone through uh, all the documents uh, that uh, are related uh, to Emilio and uh, uh, his uh, uh, <coughs> period uh, at the Scuola Normale. They came uh, very shortly after he finished uh, with his responsibilities uh, uh, with LEP uh, and uh, he retired from uh, from the school normal uh, from uh, <coughs> from from sir so uh, I'd like now to give uh, the floor to, to professor Menozzi who will tell us uh, known and less known facts uh, <laughs> about uh, Emilio particularly in this room uh, where he was uh, the chairman for a long time uh, of the so-called Consiglio Direttivo of the school, and uh, it was uh, in this room that uh, the important decisions were, were taken under his uh, chairmanship. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I am uh, sorry, but uh, I had uh, not the possibility to translate uh, my intervention in uh, English, so I will uh, speak uh, in uh, Italian. Uh, the advantage, uh, I think, uh, is that uh, you have not uh, to hear my English pronunciation. Uh, nel momento in cui ho accettato uh, l'amichevole invito di Riccardo Barbieri a tracciare un profilo della presenza di Emilio Picasso alla scuola normale, non sapevo i materiali che avrebbe restituito l'archivio. 
una non facile investigazione in carte non ancora ordinate, eh, ringrazio il personale del archi centro archivistico eh, che l'ha compiuta, ha portato ad aggiungere ai verbali del consiglio direttivo il dossier personale relativo ad Emilio Picasso. Si tratta di una documentazione che disegna gli aspetti istituzionali della sua presenza alla scuola e mi limiterò dunque a questa dimensione. Non mi è infatti possibile integrare queste fonti con il suo archivio personale e anche con le poche testimonianze orali che ho potuto raccogliere perché queste forniscono utili elementi ma inevitabilmente frammentari. Molti aspetti dunque del suo rapporto con la scuola e immagino anche aspetti importanti saranno elusi in questo mio intervento, me ne scuso in anticipo con quanti l'hanno più da vicino conosciuto, il professor Mannelli che è stato un suo stretto collaboratore in primo luogo. D'altra parte questi sono i limiti del mestiere dello studioso di storia, deve ricostruire il passato soltanto con le tracce di quel passato che in un determinato momento gli sono accessibili. Vorrei però almeno ricordare un dato, da queste asettiche carte amministrative trapela la stima, l'amicizia che lo circondavano. Alla conclusione della relazione tenuta alla riunione del Consiglio Direttivo, che l'11 settembre 1981, per presentare la candidatura di Picasso alla copertura della Cattedra di Fisica Generale, il preside della classe di Scienze, Luigi Radicati di Brozzolo, Teneva, vi osservava che oltre ai meriti scientifici il candidato, cito, è sotto ogni riguardo persona estremamente gradevole, umanamente ricca, profondamente leale. Si tratta di una valutazione che trova ancora oggi un puntuale riscontro nella memoria condivisa della comunità normalistica. Naturalmente, al centro di quella relazione di radicati stavano gli aspetti scientifici della personalità di Picasso. In seguito a questa relazione, il Consiglio erano presenti solamente 12 membri su 22, ma le assenze di fatto si riducevano a due sole componenti, perché erano assenti giustificati i professori fuori ruolo della scuola, il rettore dell'università e il preside della facoltà di scienze, che allora facevano parte del Consiglio direttivo. Allora, in seguito a questa relazione, il Consiglio decideva all'unanimità il trasferimento a Pisa di Picasso. Egli era allora professore straordinario all'Università di Messina, dove, vinto il concorso a cattedra per fisica generale bandito nel 1979, aveva iniziato la sua attività di docente di ruolo pochi mesi prima, nel maggio 1981. Nel suo intervento Radicati accennava solo di sfuggita ai suoi precedenti accademici presso l'Università di Genova, ma vorrei qui rapidamente accennarli per tracciare il profilo della sua figura. Picasso, nato nel 1927, si era laureato nel 1956, pressoché trentenne, immagino per la lenta maturazione della sua vocazione scientifica, inizialmente indirizzata alla matematica, presso l'Ateneo Ligure dove la votazione relativamente bassa conseguita nella discussione della tesi non aveva impedito ai suoi professori di intuirne subito le capacità. In effetti, all'inizio di quello stesso anno accademico, veniva chiamato a ricoprire la funzione di assistente incaricato presso la Cattedra di Fisica Sperimentale e dal 1 novembre 1959 gli veniva conferito l'incarico di professore di Fisica Sperimentale alla Facoltà di Scienze e poi di Fisica alla Facoltà di Ingegneria, fino a che il 1 luglio 1965 diventava assistente ordinario presso l'insegnamento di Fisica Generale. Nel frattempo, nel maggio 1964, aveva conseguito nella stessa disciplina la libera docenza, ma indubbiamente questi anni, che avevano visto eh, anche il matrimonio nel 1957 con Mariella Gottardi e la nascita, rispettivamente nel 1963 e nel 1965 dei due figli, questi anni erano segnati più che da preoccupazioni accademiche da un'attenzione prevalente verso la ricerca. Ben lo testimoniano le borse di studio, via via conseguite dalla Società Italiana di Fisica, dall'Istituto Nazionale di Fisica e dalla Nato. 
Quest'ultima post-doctoral fellowship in particolare gli consentiva di svolgere nel 1962-63 un soggiorno di studio a Bristol presso il gruppo che sotto la guida di Cecil Powell iniziava, eh, analizzava gli studi della radiazione cosmica. Qui avveniva il decisivo incontro con Francis Fairley che stava allora elaborando il progetto di misurare al CERN di Ginevra il momento magnetico del muone. Maturava così lo spostamento di interessi scientifici di Picasso, l'iniziale attenzione sulla tecnica delle gas bubble chambers, cui eh, sono dedicate le prime sue pubblicazioni uscite alla fine degli anni 50, e sulla fisica delle emulsioni nucleari, che costituisce l'argomento dei suoi interventi nei primi anni 60, si indirizza nella seconda metà del decennio verso la fisica delle particelle. Nel 1966 inizia infatti la lunga serie di saggi, articoli, interventi a congressi, apparsi spesso in prestigiose sedi editoriali che hanno per tema il muone, l'elettrodinamica quantistica e la verifica della teoria della relatività. Nella relazione con cui illustrava il profilo scientifico di Picasso, il preside della classe di lettere, di scienze, pur ricordando che le pubblicazioni del candidato ammontavano in complesso allora, 1980, 40 titoli, si soffermava proprio su questi ultimi anni del suo lavoro, mettendo in rilievo eh, che eh, Picasso aveva conseguito, cito, un posto di primo piano tra i fisici della sua generazione, in quanto aveva rivelato doti non solo di fine sperimentatore, ma anche di abile e paziente direttore di grosse equip di ricercatori. Radicati ricordava a questo proposito l'impegno nella verifica sperimentale dell'elettrodinamica quantistica attraverso una serie di misure di altissima precisione del momento magnetico del muone che l'avevano portato a dimostrare che questo mesone si comporta sotto ogni riguardo come un elettrone pesante. Sottolineava poi anche l'altro campo di investigazione in cui Picasso si era distinta una volta terminate le esperienze in questo ambito, cioè la sua proposta di nuovi ed originali metodi per misurare le onde gravitazionali. Ma soprattutto si soffermava sul percorso compiuto da Picasso al CERN, dove è entrato nel 1964 come Research Associate, era diventato nel 1968 staff member, nel 1972 leader of the Nuclear Physics Division e nel 1980 project leader del Large Electron Positron Collider, cioè il direttore della progettazione e della realizzazione di un anello di accumulazione di elettroni e positroni di 100 miliardi di elettron volt per fascio e subito dopo è rientrato a, a, come membro del direttorato del CERN. Radicati richiamava in particolare l'attenzione dei colleghi della scuola sui possibili sviluppi dell'anello di accelerazione costruito a Ginevra, cui Picasso si stava dedicando, e a suo giudizio gli approfondimenti sulle applicazioni delle cavità superconduttrici a radiofrequenza costituivano il dato cruciale che i membri del Consiglio Direttivo dovevano considerare per orientare la loro decisione in merito alla chiamata di Picasso. Sosteneva che si trattava, cito, della scelta migliore che la scuola normale potrebbe fare in questo momento per due ragioni. Da un lato, un fisico di grande prestigio internazionale, lo confermavano la sua partecipazione al comitato editoriale della rivista americana Annals of Physics, la sua presenza nel consiglio scientifico del Max Planck Institute e del Laboratorio delle Alte Energie di Amburgo, la sua nomina a Murray Slob Lecturer all'Università di Harvard, Tutte appunto queste eh, prestigiose qualifiche potevano eh, aprire, attraverso i suoi contatti con i centri più attivi di ricerca nel mondo, agli allievi della scuola importanti nuove strade. Dall'altro lato, uno scienziato, cito, di alto e confermato valore avrebbe contribuito a consolidare quella fama che la scuola era riuscita a conquistarsi nel mondo, nel campo della fisica. La votazione unanime che formalizzava l'inquadramento di Picasso nel corpo docente della scuola era in realtà l'esito di un processo che era cominciato tre anni prima. 
In effetti, nel 1978, approfittando della possibilità offerta da una convenzione con l'Accademia dei Lincei, stipulata alla fine degli anni 60 da Gilberto Bernardini per, attirare, eh, presso, per attivare presso la normale lezioni di eminenti personalità culturali, eh, Picasso era stato invitato a tenere alcuni eh, seminari. Questo suo impegno eh, didattico eh, si inseriva peraltro in una serie di interventi sulla fisica delle particelle elementari che eh, erano stati svolte da eminenti personalità, tra gli altri alcuni premi Nobel, Li Yang Gelman, eh, ed il successo di questa esperienza di, di insegnamento si era poi poco dopo coniugata con l'idoneità conseguita da Picasso al concorso a cattedra bandito nel 1979. Era proprio in questo contesto, quindi nel contesto di una presenza didattica che si inseriva in un filone praticato nella, nella, nella scuola, che Radicati, dopo un'ampia consultazione di, di, di colleghi, inoltrava all'inizio del 1981 all'allora direttore della scuola, Edoardo Viesentini, la richiesta di una cattedra di fisica. Nella sua lettera ehm, Radicati notava che il settore, dopo il collogamento fuori ruolo di Bernardini, risultava scoperto, mentre presso gli allievi della scuola cresceva l'esigenza di una formazione adeguata ehm, nell'ambito di quella fisica sperimentale che, scriveva Radicati, oggi con i progettati sviluppi dei nuovi acceleratori si presentano particolarmente interessanti e promettenti per il futuro. Il parere che Vesentini chiedeva a Bernardini incontrava la piena approvazione del predecessore alla guida della scuola, quest'ultimo Bernardini, in quanto direttore di ricerca al, Cerc, al CERN, aveva ben conosciuto Picasso e lo giudicava, cito, un ricercatore di livello eccezionale. E subito appunto Bernardini si attivava per appoggiare l'istanza di istituire una nuova cattedra di fisica alla normale. L'operazione aveva però un esito tutt'altro che scontato. Se non era stato difficile aggregare il consenso interno allo scuola, dal momento che la chiamata del fisico veniva inquadrata in un disegno generale che puntava al contestuale rafforzamento di innovative discipline umanistiche, come la linguistica e la storia economica, restava il problema di trovare le risorse necessarie a questo ampliamento della didattica. E al fine di ottenerle, fin dal dicembre 1980, era stato rivolto un invito all'allora direttore generale del Ministero, Domenico Fazio, di visitare a Ginevra, accompagnato da Visentini e da Radicati, l'acceleratore in costruzione per rendersi conto di persona del gigantesco sforzo che sotto la direzione di uno studioso italiano come Picasso e con il contributo italiano si stava realizzando. Ma la mancata risposta positiva all'invito non consentiva certo di avere molte certezze in merito alla chiamata di Picasso. E allora in questo momento che Vesentini decideva di indirizzarsi direttamente al Ministro della Pubblica Istruzione, allora Aldo Potrato, per chiedergli eh, esplicitamente eh, una eh, domanda eh, di ehm, attivare le risorse, di, di concedere le risorse necessarie all'istituzione della cattedra, accompagnando quella lettera con una, ehm, eh, eh, con una lettera di sostegno del premio Nobel, Tsung Dao Li, e con un denso promemoria sulla situazione degli studi all'interno della scuola. E quest'ultimo documento, eh, che partiva dalla illustrazione degli studi di fisica delle alte energie, che si era tenuto alla, normali, eh, alla normale, una tradizione che partendo da Fermi, passando per Giovanni Polvani, Enrico Perrucca, Giovanni Gentile Junior, Carlo Rubia, giungeva fino alle ricerche condotte negli ultimi anni. Ma per i perfezionandi presso la normale era essenziale, in considerazione delle possibilità conoscitive offerte dal CERN, sviluppare uno stretto rapporto con il laboratorio ginevrino. Non era solo una via per facilitare la loro carriera individuale, si trattava anche di consolidare nel mondo scientifico europeo ed internazionale la posizione della scuola nel campo di questi studi e dunque attraverso il consolidamento della posizione della scuola anche ottenere una maggiore considerazione del ruolo italiano nella ricerca. 
secondo ehm, Visentini, dunque per cogliere questa opportunità occorreva un coordinamento delle attività e occorreva l'ottimizzazione delle iniziative in atto che solo l'ancoraggio ad un insegnamento di alto livello nel campo della fisica poteva permettere. E dopo questa lettera, nel giugno 1981, Vesentini poteva comunicare a Radicati che il ministro aveva accolto questa sua richiesta così articolata e così motivata. Si poteva dunque iniziare l'iter per formalizzare l'istituzione dell'insegnamento, una procedura che è iniziata, come di consueto, con la deliberazione del Consiglio della classe eh, di, di, di scienze di assegnare la cattedra fisica generale e di attribuirla per trasferimento, continuata con la ricezione di questa mh, proposta da parte del Consiglio di, direttivo, chiamava, che, eh, culminava con la votazione unanime del settembre 1981, cui ho fatto cenno. In realtà l'attivazione della nuova cattedra rischiava di saltare per un disguido burocratico, eh, sono le carte che eh, testimoniano di vicende abbastanza eh, curiose. Dopo la fine del concorso la direzione generale dell'istruzione universitaria del Ministero inoltrava alla questura di Genova l'usuale richiesta di inviare ogni possibile notizia circa la condotta morale e civile del professor Picasso, ma nonostante i due successivi solleciti, a Roma non era mai arrivata la risposta della Questura di Genova e solo un'allarmatissima lettera dell'ottobre 1981 del direttore della scuola al Questore di Pisa otteneva, appunto dicendo che sarebbe saltato per quell'anno accademico la chiamata di Visentini se non si fosse mandato questo documento richiesto dall'amministrazione statale, era solo appunto grazie a questo intervento del Questore di Pisa attivato dal direttore della scuola che arrivava la documentazione richiesta e che il primo novembre 1981 Picasso poteva prendere servizio come professore di fisica generale alla normale. Pochi giorni dopo avanzava l'istanza di essere collocato fuori ruolo fino al 31 ottobre 1984 mantenendo la titolarità della cattedra al fine di poter continuare la sua direzione del progetto LEP al CERN. Il consiglio direttivo approvava all'unanimità la domanda che si sarebbe ripetuta con analogo esito nei due trienni successivi 1984-87-1987-90. La scarsa documentazione relativa a questo periodo non permette di individuare in maniera analitica i rapporti di Picasso con la scuola nel decennio 81-90. Attraverso le carte relative al suo passaggio all'ordinariato si può però, avvenuto nel 1985, si può però ritenere che nella primavera di ogni anno egli svolgesse regolarmente corsi e seminari 10, 12, 15 ore, per alcuni dei quali possediamo anche i titoli Teoria degli acceleratori, metrologia delle misure di frequenza, polarizzazione dei fasci di elettroni e positroni in anelli di accelerazione di altissima energia, possibilità di costruzione di un convertitore di frequenza basato sull'amplificazione parametrica. Ma accanto a questa attività propriamente didattica, Picasso svolgeva anche alcune conferenze di carattere divulgativo. Il dato forse più significativo appare però il coinvolgimento sia in tesi di laurea per allievi ordinari, sia in tesi di dottorato per gli allievi del corso di perfezionamento, che riguardano tutte le questioni connesse alla sua attività al CERN. Ecco, c'è proprio questa insistenza di un coinvolgimento degli allievi nei problemi che poneva la costruzione dell'acceleratore. Negli anni successivi il coinvolgimento di studenti e di ricercatori della scuola nel progetto LEP appare via via crescente, tanto da essere citato nel parere favorevole del Ministero degli Esteri alla concessione del fuori ruolo per il triennio 1987-90, mi pare appunto la testimonianza di questa crescente accelerazione di, eh, eh, di coinvolgimenti interni. La conclusione del progetto nel 1989 comportava dunque la presa di servizio alla scuola il primo novembre 1990. In realtà 
essa avvenne l'anno successivo perché nell'agosto del 1989 Picasso chiede e subito ottiene dal consiglio direttivo un altro anno di fuori ruolo con l'impegno di tenere gli ormai abituali seminari al palazzo della carovana. Infatti aveva ricevuto l'invito a passare un trimestre come Distinguished Visiting Professor presso l'Istituto Fermi dell'Università di Chicago e al contempo desiderava, dopo il quindicennio genev ginevrino, riorganizzare i suoi impegni in vista dell'adempimento dei compiti da svolgere alla scuola. A testimonianza del saldo rapporto che aveva instaurato con l'Istituto dei Piazza dei Cavalieri, il 21 giugno 1991, dunque prima ancora della sua presa di servizio effettivo, veniva eletto direttore della scuola per il quadriennio 1991-94, su, eh, succedendo, e immagino su sua esplicita sollecitazione, a Radicati. Assunto l'incarico, decideva di prendere domicilio al Collegio Timpano, dove avrebbe poi ottenuto un modesto ampliamento realizzato in economia dello spazio in quel collegio allora riservato al direttore per alloggiare la famiglia e per promuovere la socialità attinente a, alla funzione direttiva. La normale che Picasso era chiamato a governare costituiva una realtà quantitativamente modesta, rispetto alle analoghe strutture di alta formazione europea. Allora vi erano 279 allievi, tra ordinari e perfezionandi, 25 professori ordinari e 7 associati, 89 ricercatori, 204 impiegati su un organico che di per sé ne prevedeva 236. In una intervista rilasciata al quotidiano La Repubblica, pochi mesi dopo l'elezione, emergevano i tratti che avrebbero caratterizzato la direzione di Picasso. Da un lato, egli prospettava l'esigenza di un rinnovamento profondo della scuola, in modo che nel sistema universitario italiano arrivasse a svolgere lo stesso ruolo che in altri paesi europei svolgevano analoghi istituti e citava esplicitamente l'Ecole Normale Supérieure di Parigi, i collegi di Oxford e Cambridge in Gran Bretagna. Dall'altro lato manifestava la consapevolezza della difficoltà del compito a cui si sarebbe dedicato per la vischiosità, le difficoltà e le remore derivanti dalla struttura organizzativa dello Stato e della società nel nostro Paese. Non a caso l'intervistatore eh, poteva concludere l'articolo su Repubblica notando che dalle parole di Picasso aveva potuto ricavare un'impressione. Era stato molto più facile realizzare il LEP, quella che lui chiamava la più grande macchina del mondo, che non sarebbe stato facile appunto adeguare la normale agli standard europei. Era ovviamente una battuta del giornalista, ma eh, traduceva assai bene, mi pare, il senso di quella, di quella intervista. I verbali del Consiglio Direttivo mostrano via via gli ostacoli incontrati da una linea di governo imperniata sull'ampliamento della scuola in termini di allievi, professori, spazie, strutture, relazioni con istituzioni accademiche, sulla internazionalizzazione dell'attività didattica e di ricerca, sulla razionalizzazione dell'amministrazione interna in base a criteri che esplicitamente Picasso ricordava di economicità e di efficienza, sulla incentivazione della presenza del nel, della scuola nel dibattito culturale della società civile italiana. Non ho ovviamente qui la possibilità di presentare in maniera dettagliata le sue linee operative, ma vorrei almeno accennare due aspetti che mi pare che nella sua direzione assumano un rilievo centrale. In primo luogo, gli obiettivi di sviluppo che Picasso intende promuovere si scontrano con i condizionamenti derivanti dalla politica universitaria dei governi dei primi anni 90. L'esigenza di controllare una spesa pubblica che già allora si percepiva difficilmente controllabile si traduce infatti nel blocco dei trasferimenti ministeriali delle risorse finanziarie alla scuola a livello del 1989, mentre nel quinquennio successivo, cioè il quinquennio della sua direzione, vi è un incremento medio annuale dei prezzi del 5%. E evidentemente la diminuzione di risorse si fa sentire. Alla diminuzione di queste risorse il direttore cerca naturalmente di ovviare con l'attivazione di altri canali di finanziamento, sia privati che pubblici, ma incontra un altro ostacolo, 
poco può fare con una legislazione universitaria, soprattutto in materia di personale tecnico e amministrativo, confusa e contraddittoria, che per di più i vari organi dello Stato interpretano in maniera contrastante persino a livello giurisdizionale. La protesta eh, inviata nel luglio 1993 al Ministero perché, cito, si esprima con prontezza e senza ambiguità in una materia così delicata quale l'interpretazione e l'attuazione della legislazione riguardante il personale universitario costituisce una delle tante testimonianze d'archivio della sua reazione all'impossibilità di programmare seriamente lo sviluppo della scuola sulla base dei quadri normativi esistenti. Nel quadro dei problemi generali rientra anche una normativa universitaria che all'epoca attribuiva al direttore amministrativo delle istituzioni accademiche, oltre ai compiti esecutivi, anche funzioni di indirizzo. I verbali dell'organo di governo della scuola, registrando il frequente voto contrario del direttore amministrativo o la sua astensione eh, alle, eh, sulle proposte del direttore, sono rimasto davvero molto colpito che eh, sì, le, le carte testimoniano questo dato di fatto, eh, evidenziano, mi pare, le tensioni che questa situazione provocava al Palazzo della Carovana. Le conseguenti disfunzioni, inevitabili disfunzioni, chi è chiamato ad eseguire un ordine si oppone a quell'ordine, mi pare, appaiono solo in parte ovviate dal fatto che dopo un istenuante dibattito interno Picasso impone un vice direttore amministrativo di sua fiducia. Quando finalmente un decreto legislativo del 1993 specificherà le competenze del direttore amministrativo, escludendo appunto funzioni di indirizzo, si aprirà tuttavia all'interno della guida della scuola un nuovo conflitto sulla interpretazione di questo, di questo decreto. Le dimissioni anticipate della funzionaria che allora ricopriva la carica di direttore amministrativo saranno l'esito di questa uh, ulteriore discussione. Questo risultato non implicava però la soluzione di tutti i problemi interni. Lo statuto della scuola, risalente al 1969, appesantiva le riunioni del Consiglio Direttivo che, secondo Picasso, assommavano troppi compiti, cioè funzioni di indirizzo politico-culturale, le fu funzioni di consiglio di amministratore, competenze didattiche e organizzative tipiche dei consigli eh, di, eh, di classe. E dunque per L'intrecciarsi di questo insieme di competenze Picasso riteneva che il, il Consiglio Direttivo non funzionasse con l'efficienza, la snellezza eh, che eh, doveva invece eh, perseguire. Ne è testimonianza il fatto che tante volte le riunioni, come mostrano appunto i verbali del Consiglio Direttivo, tante volte i consigli direttivi non riuscivano a portare a termine l'esame dell'ordine del giorno. Dopo aver cercato di assicurare ai dibattiti del Consiglio un carattere esclusivamente tecnico, riservandosi anche di nominare esperti esterni di volta in volta chiamati dal direttore a illustrare la natura delle questioni in gioco, Picasso decideva di avviare, attraverso i lavori di un'apposita commissione, la redazione di un nuovo statuto della scuola. Sarebbe stato approvato nel 1995, dopo una discussione assai faticosa e complessa, che tuttavia non sembra essere giunta a definire un assetto soddisfacente, infatti non a caso, qualche anno dopo, si rendeva nuovamente necessario un completo rifacimento dello statuto interno. Nel frattempo, mi pare si possa dire che erano maturati due più importanti risultati della direzione dello scienziato alla guida della scuola. Si, ehm, eh, si realizzava infatti una notevole espansione edilizia, eh, credo che abbiamo qui il Presidente della Commissione Edilizia dell'epoca che può testimoniare, mi pare, quello che accade, accade a, allora, appunto si realizzò una notevole espansione edilizia portando a soluzione annose questioni come la questione dell'alloggio per gli allievi attraverso la messa in opera di nuovi collegi, il Fermi ed i Cartucci, così come si avviava l'acquisizione di nuovi spazi per laboratori e centri di ricerca con l'ingresso della scuola nel complesso di San Silvestro, la sua originaria sede napoleonica. Inoltre, ecco, questo è il primo aspetto, mi pare il primo grande risultato di quella direzione, il secondo aspetto è lo sforzo del direttore per promuovere una conoscenza adeguata della normale nell'opinione pubblica e la sua incidenza nella vita civile e culturale del Paese e anche a livello europeo. 
aveva un notevolissimo successo la suo desiderio di rafforzare i corsi di orientamento universitario che si tenevano a Cortona, così come aveva un grande successo la sua iniziativa di collaborare eh, con le scuole superiori e con i loro eh, insegnanti. Per quanto eh, Picasso venisse nel frattempo insignito di numerosi premi, riconoscimenti, a testimonianza appunto dell'apprezzamento della sua attività, Melipide dottò a ricordare l'onorificenza di Cavaliere della Legione d'Onore attribuitagli dal governo francese, le difficoltà di governo eh, della scuola eh, gli fecero a più riprese avanzare l'ipotesi delle eh, dimissioni e tuttavia portò eh, fermamente a termine il suo eh, mandato. Poi il primo novembre 1995 riprendeva le funzioni di professore unitario, eh, un, un, ordinario tenendo eh, una serie di lezioni, dedicando la sua ricerca agli studi eh, di strumenti elettromagnetici per apprezzare con sempre maggiore precisione gli spostamenti dei fasci di particelle, partecipando agli esperimenti del protosincrotrone del laboratorio statunitense di Brookhaven. Veniva confermato in servizio oltre i limiti di età dal 1997 al 99, teneva seminari come professori fuori ruolo fino al 2002 per essere infine proclamato professore emerito. Ecco, eh, si chiude credo qui la, il, pro, il profilo, vorrei però ricordare un ultimo fatto che è quasi una testimonianza emblematica delle difficoltà del suo rapporto con la pubblica amministrazione del nostro Paese, appunto chi veniva dall'esperienza dall del CERN probabilmente si trovava davanti a strutture che non era abituato a guidare. Un ultimo fatto, se volete, minimo, ma credo emblematico, indicativo di questa difficoltà di rapporto. La determinazione del il suo trattamento di quiescenza era ritardata da due fatti, cioè che l'Università di Genova, anziché spedire alla normale la documentazione relativa ai servizi prestati all'Ateneo, li spediva all'Università di Pisa, da un lato, e dall'altro lato che a Roma il Ministero impiegava quasi un anno per eh, giungere alla esatta quantificazione ai fini pensionistici del periodo che eh, il professore aveva trascorso al CERN. Grazie. No, vorrei davvero ringraziare molto il relatore per questa relazione che eh, resterà, spero, eh, negli archivi della scuola a documentare in una maniera esaustiva effettivamente tutti i rapporti che, eh, di un certo tipo eh, che Emilio ha avuto con la scuola, ma naturalmente eh, non può comprendere tutti quei rapporti di, di, di amicizia e di piacevole convivenza che hanno caratterizzato i suoi rapporti con la scuola. Grazie a tutti. Grazie molto. Ora, ora vorrei dare il benvenuto a, a Mariella e al figlio che, che sono arrivati nel frattempo e che... Now I would like to call on Professor Herbie Schopper to come and uh, uh, to talk about the lab from uh, its conception to the completion. Uh, Professor Schopper, at least uh, among physicists, uh, doesn't really need to be uh, introduced because uh, he is uh, well known for his multiple uh, functions uh, in uh, both uh, Germany and uh, at CERN and more recently even uh, hopefully positive and significant contribution uh, to the situation in the Middle East uh, where uh, a project uh, uh, for the construction of a synchrotron radiation facility is coming to completion in a contest uh, where countries that uh, uh, in the normal relationship uh, actually don't talk to each other uh, are willing to share uh, 
uh, knowledge and, and education, and, and this is, uh, is quite important. But uh, <coughs> I would like on this occasion uh, to uh, mention an aspect of the activity of Herwig, which uh, is perhaps uh, uh, not so well known, uh, and that is uh, innovation in instrumentation. As, as a physicist, uh, as far as I remember, he was uh, uh, among the first, if not the very first, uh, to use uh, uh, calorimetry, hadron calorimetry, to measure uh, neutron energy and uh, uh, high energy. And, and this was uh, in particular exploited uh, uh, at the Prodvino accelerator in the early 70s uh, when uh, this uh, machine uh, built in the, in the Soviet Union was uh, uh, the proton synchrotron of the highest energy in, in the world. Now this technique is considered obvious, uh, but uh, uh, at the time uh, it corresponded to uh, an intuition uh, and to a practical application of the technique which uh, was, very, was very remarkable. So it's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Erwin Schopper telling us about this uh, great uh, scientific uh, enterprise uh, that is uh, the lab project. Thank you. Thank you, Italo. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back here at the Scuola Normale to meet many old friends, in particular also to see Mariella today here again. Uh, ma è anche un ricordo un poco triste perché l'ultima volta che sono stato qua Emilio era ancora qua e mi ha mostrato e spiegato quello che si faceva qui alla scuola normale in tempi passati. But now I come back to the general language of physicists broke English. To explain to you the real outstanding contribution of Emilio to this big project lab, I have to explain to you a little bit what the general situation at CERN was at that time. Indeed, I was uh, appointed as director general a year before I took over it's the usual procedure at CERN to guarantee a smooth transition from one director general to the next one. But when I came to CERN, there were indeed still two CERNs present there. CERN 1 and CERN 2 with two director generals. I don't have the time to, go, to explain to you why that happened, this history. But the first thing I was asked was to unify CERN. So I complained that I had to do the job of two director generals for one salary. But the second uh, task was to propose lab, get it approved, and finally built. Now, uh, I, uh, I can't see it well, well there, so I have to. <laughs> I come here, yeah, I can see better here. Well, yes, that's better. So that's better. So uh, to fulfill these two jobs, uh, I had to set up a directorate as usual. There were two scientific directors. The one was uh, uh, Robert Klappisch and French and uh, Butterworth and uh, British. And then there was an accelerator for, uh, a director for accelerator, was Giorgio Bianti, the one of the solid pillars of CERN since many, many years, director of administration. But finally, I had to appoint a director for the new project lab. And that was a problem. Indeed, I appointed Emilio Picasso which many people were, did not understand. They asked me whether I was crazy. Because Emilio was a well-known physicist, experimental physicist, but he was not an accelerator expert. And there were many outstanding accelerator people at, at CERN. So why did I not appoint an accelerator expert, but an uh, experimental scientist? Well, the main reason was where the human qualities of Emilio. I mean, I was sure that the necessary 
accelerator expertise it was available at CERN anyway because there were so many good people. But what was necessary under these particular conditions of, to which I will come back were the human qualities of Emilio in the sense that, first of all, he was respected by everybody at CERN, by the scientists, by the accelerator people, by the technicians, by the whole staff. And second, Emilio could listen to people, he would understand them, and in case of conflict, he was able to smooth the waves and find ways, find solutions to all the problems. I had not worked with Emilio before in any experiments, but as was mentioned just by Professor Minozzi, when I had been uh, uh, division leader of what at that time was called nuclear physics division at CERN, Emilio followed me as division leader. So that was the first time we got in closer contact. When he was appointed as project leader of, of LAP, I warned him that uh, the, uh, the job would be very difficult. Because uh, LAP was approved under conditions, and i come, come back to that in a moment, which, were, which happened for the first time at CERN. CERN had to be, uh, uh, LAP has, was approved without additional money and without additional staff. So without the unification of CERN, one and two, it would not have been possible to build LAP because all the resources had to be found within the existing laboratory. And for, for instance, 30% of the existing staff had to be redirected to work with LAP, which was psychologically a very difficult problem because there are people working under for 10, 10, 20 years under a certain supervisor, suddenly we are asked to change completely their job. And if you ask in any organization that 30% of the people had to be uh, used in different ways, it's, it's a very difficult job. Now, there, Emilio was quite essential to do that. And as I come back to that, we also had problems with uh, not getting additional money. Now, I must say, during all the time and the difficulties we had to overcome, and I will mention them a few, we really become friends. And uh, I had always, we were trusting each other uh, all the time without uh, uh, limits. But that didn't hinder Emilio to threaten me several times with his resignation. He was a good psychologist when it came to negotiation. I'll come back to that. Well, let uh, was, had been discussed already in the 70s, and several proposals have been made. The first proposal was the so-called LAP-100, was a machine with a tunnel 50 uh, kilometers circumference. Uh, that was refused, not even costed, because it was considered to be too ambitious. In 1978, a, a proposal was made, the so-called Blue Book, with a, a tunnel with a circumference of 22 kilometers and an energy of 70 GeV. That was refused by the physicists because it was thought the energy was too low. So finally, in 1978, John Adams came up with a so-called pink book, which was a compromise between the two with a circumference of about 31 kilometers at in the first stage, an energy with copper cavities of 86 GeV, which then could be upgraded by using superconducting cavities to 120 uh, GeV. Now, this was uh, the cost was 1.3 billion Swiss francs at the time, was refused to be too high. So at that time, then John Adams came with a new proposal. He said he had considered originally LEP as a machine alone standing without using any of the infrastructure of CERN, of the existing CERN. So he came up with a proposal and said, no, we can do it by using the existing accelerators at CERN as injectors. And in that way, he brought down the costs from 1.3 billion Swiss francs to 950 billion. Now, then I was appointed and I, we were asked during my year of transition 
the three director generals to come up with a common proposal and we made a common proposal to the council in the summer of 1980 and that was this uh, uh, reduced version of the pink book. I come back to the final green book in a, in a moment, then a year later I made the final proposal with the so-called green book. Now, in when the negotiations with the member states started, we had very hard dis discussions because it was the first time at CERN that the member states said, you won't get any additional money for that project. You have to find all the resources with, within the existing budget, not with, within the existing budget, but within a constant budget. And in fact, I proposed at first time a constant budget of 629 million, which was much lower and I'll show you a picture in a moment, then the combined budget of CERN 1 and CERN 2. We uh, had to reduce the tunnel from the 30 kilometers, which we had proposed by John Adams, to 27 kilometers. And one idea of Emilio Picasso was that we had to declare it as a stripped-down lab which means a machine which would not be completed in the first phase, but would be completed in various stages, with first a stripped-down phase, where one could do already interesting physics, which then later would be upgraded from lab 1 to lab 2, and finally what now is called LHC, which for us, I think also for Giorgio Brianti, who was essentially at that time, uh, was for us all lab 3. Now, because of the limitations, we also said there should only be four experiments at, uh, at lab instead of the possible eight. And uh, we said that the total investment for the machine would be 910 million. But we had to say, and Emilio pointed that out again and again, there was no contingency foreseen. And usually, if you have a project, there's some contingency foreseen in the budget for unforeseen. We said, look, in that uh, amount, there's no contingency foreseen. If something unforeseen happens, contingency would be time. That was a say, the saying of Emilio all the time. Another completely new aspect was, it was the first time that for a project at CERN, we had to tell the users coming from the outside, there's no money for the experiments. You have to find the money yourself for the experiments. It has to be financed outside the third budget. And you have to bring it, not the money, you can bring equipment, you can bring it by contribution in kind, can bring it to, to, to CERN, but CERN cannot provide any money for the experiments. That was completely new. <coughs> we could only provide 20 million or so for some uh, infrastructure things. Still, with all these restrictions which we proposed to council, the lab approval was still extremely painful. One problem was that because of the proposal to use existing machines as <coughs> pre-accelerators for CERN, lab had to be an element of the basic program of CERN, which means that all member states had to agree to it and contrib contribute to it. It was not possible that some member states would say, no, we stay in the basic program of CERN, but we don't contribute to that. So all member states had to be uh, convinced, and they said, no, no, 629 million per year is too much. Some member states said, no, should be reduced to 610, and after long discussions, the compromise was 670. Well, you would say 617, 629, not a big difference. But for the construction time, which was foreseen for eight years, the difference amounts up to 100 million, which means was a reduction of 100 million. was not, uh, not, uh, uh, not so easy. So, uh, in, indeed, the physicists, also the scientific policy committee of CERN, and in particular the staff, said no to build that machine with 117 billion per year is impossible. That means it will be built at the cost of the staff. And they said I should resign. I did not resign because if I resign, what is uh, a gate? We won't get more money because of that. So I won't go into details after longer pork barrel discussions with council. And finally, in a special council session in October 1981, uh, that was approved unanimously. 
And I must say, it's still today uh, the practice of CERN that CERN has, since the last 35 years, had to work with a constant budget whenever a new project was uh, proposed, was no additional money, uh, but had to be found more or less in existing uh, resources. These consequences had some very uh, uh, severe consequences on the existing program of CERN. For instance, we had to stop the so-called ISR, which was the only proton-proton collider which existed at that time of the world and was doing excellent physics. So some people uh, blamed us and said that's vandalism to, to close down these machines. And many of the other programs had to be closed down or reduced. Well, we lost many friends at that time in the directorate, but fortunately, most came back. In spite of all these difficulties, we kept one program going on, which was the proton-antiproton collider in the SPS, which was used later by Carlo Rubia and the other people to discover the W and the Z particle. And another program which we even started was the heavy iron program. But there again, we had to tell people for the experiments, you have to find the money outside. Now, there were many legal problems with the host states. And I was surprised that after 30 years, all these problems are forgotten today. Or most of them are forgotten. Today. The situation was different in Switzerland and in France. In Switzerland, for any new project, you have to make a public referendum. And the question was, has to be a referendum in, uh, in, uh, in the canton of Geneva for the new project. If that would have been necessary, that would have delayed the project by many years. Fortunately, it was one conseiller d'etat, uh, Jacques Verde, and I think he doesn't get enough merit for that. He alone decided that no referendum is necessary. And on the last day when he was in office, there had been elections. And in fact, he was followed by a successor from another party who was against the project. So in the last day of his office, he gave this document signed by him that no referendum is necessary. The situation in France was completely different. In France, if you own property, it belongs to you now to the center of the earth, in principle. If there's oil, it belongs to the state. But in principle, uh, you have the right now to the center of the earth. So LEP was, uh, had to be, the tunnel had to be dig under about 2,000 uh, owners of territory. And each of them could have gone to, uh, uh, to court and asked to stop the project. So the project would never, uh, could never be done. So we had to get, we had to go to the highest court in France and get what's called a Déclaration d'utilité publique, which uh, means that a project is declared in public interest. People can still go to court and uh, ask for uh, indemnization for all kinds of damage, but they cannot stop the project. But to get this Déclaration d'utilité publique, many things were required. In, uh, 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 Etude de Pact, for instance, uh, and it was an enormous work where uh, uh, Emilio Picasso, together with Henri Laporte, who was responsible for that, played a major uh, role to get that through. I mean, there were many enemies in the Pays de Gex against this project, and the general slogan was, so far, CERN was inside the Pays de Gex, which is a region, a uh, French region near to Geneva. And they said, if LEP is built, then the Pays de Gex is inside CERN and not the vice versa. And there were many other problems. Of course, the people were afraid that the, about 100,000 truckloads of rock had to be removed from the tunnel through shafts. And uh, they thought that for many years, the whole uh, environment would be uh, disturbed by, by trucks. And some people uh, complained that if we built uh, all kinds of schooling towers, the view of the Mont Blanc would be disturbed and so on. So it was very difficult to get uh, over get this. And I must say, uh, I was surprised. When I came to CERN, I found out that my predecessors had followed the policy. They said, well, look, to explain to the general population what we do at CERN is hopeless. They won't understand it anyway, so we don't try. So the people around CERN really did not know what CERN was doing. 
And the problem was that CERN in this acronym had the N for nuclear physics. But people thought nuclear is to do with nuclear energy. So we are thinking CERN was doing nuclear energy. It's nothing to do with nuclear energy, it was doing research. So we had to start a really a campaign to explain to people around CERN what we were doing. So many uh, uh, public uh, talks were organized in Geneva, in, in particular also in France around, and to change the perception of the people of, of CERN. And there the senior CERN staff, and particular also Emilio Picasso, did an excellent job and it helped very much that Emilia was living in France, in Turin nearby, and he could help to convince these people there that there was no danger from the lab and they wouldn't suffer any, not too much. Well, there was still... ...of this, the size of the tunnel and the position of the tunnel. Because here you see a, a green, perhaps the largest tunnel on the left, was the original tunnel of 30 kilometers which had been foreseen, which was passing deep under the Jura Mountains. Now, that was too big, so we, we changed it to 27, but the, maybe it's difficult to see, between the green and the red ring, there's a yellow ring, which was the position of the lab when it was approved by council. But even after the approval, we uh, were discussing it, and this, lap, this yellow part still well, had about eight kilometers under the Jura mountain, which were geologically very difficult. In fact, Emilio had excellent, uh, built up excellent uh, uh, relations with uh, tunneling experts. One of them was uh, Giovanni Lombardi, one of the best known tunneling experts in the world. And when Lombardi learned from Emilio under which conditions lab had to be built concerning the time schedule, that we had no, uh, no uh, extra money to, to cover any unforeseen things. Uh, Lombardi said, you either get the tunnel out of the mountain uh, uh, or my advice is to let it build other people. So, what should we do? At that time, many people got afraid that the trouble was that geology, I mean, the Jura about as many cracks which are full of water, many cavities. So there was a danger if the tunnel, tunneling machines and things that would fall in the cavity, disappear completely, or there would be water in the tunnel under high pressure because mounts go up 1,000 meters. So many people started to think about the dangers and many people said, look, you have to come back to this, uh, this uh, pr pr proposal of the Blue Book, a ring with 22 kilometers, because the 22 kilometers would have been sufficient to get the energies necessary to, to uh, see the W, to discover the W, no, to, to investigate the W and the C particles, which are the most interesting part of the physics. So, in fact, I got letters from two colleagues, John Adams, who was one of the major experts, and also from Carl Rubia, saying, reduce the tunnel and go back to 22 kilometers. And I must tell you, there had long discussions with Emilio. I had the very bad nights. I'm sure also Emilio had a few bad nights. And in the end, we decided to stick to the 27 kilometer tunnel because having in the mind the future of the tunnel, not only for lab, but for other possibilities. Indeed, as it is now the LHC, we thought now we take the risk, uh, the geological risk would stick to 27 kilometers. At that time also, uh, there was a, a workshop in Lausanne where already the idea came up that after lab, one could put, in addition to lab, another machine in the same tunnel, which is the LHC. Well, this was not realized later. It turned out that space in the tunnel was not sufficient. So lab was thrown out, but the LHC is now in the tunnel. And without going too much into details now, I think uh, the uh, heritage of Emilio uh, to the LHC is that we have decided to keep the tunnel at 27 kilometers. 
uh, which is the only reason for that decision was the LHC was not the uh, lab itself uh, was not necessary. Now, uh, what we did, however, was we moved the ring a little bit out from the to the position to the right, and the lab was put in a inclined plane uh, to uh, reduce somewhat the, the, ge the uh, geologic difficulties, but still we could not avoid them completely. I'll come back to that in a moment. Well. So at a certain moment, all these problems, uh, uh, preliminary problems, were overcome. And on the 30th of September 1983, we had a groundbreaking ceremony with the presence of the two presidents of the host states, both Mitterrand from France and Aubert from Switzerland. And since we were short in manpower, in the left you see, we asked them to help to, to do some work. So they, put the first building stone, and here on the right side you see Emilio explaining to the two gentlemen what the project would be look like. Now, of course, what happened was that our decision had serious consequences when the tunnel was made. We had water in the tunnel, was uh, the price we had to pay that. In fact, it delayed lab one year, cost some extra money, but I think now, afterwards, everybody is very happy that we kept the tunnel at 27 kilometers for LHC. Tunneling was very difficult, all kinds of problems. I will not go into the detail, but still, nobody here will talk about tunnel. Let me say a few words at least. You see, it was a big project, not easy. But Emilio always was on the front. Uh, whenever there were problems, he was there and tried to overcome them. And there were the following problems. Of course, the firms which did the tunneling had made a cost estimate which was very low in order to get the contract. And then whenever there was something unforeseen happening, that water came in or something came down and so on, they came and asked for more money. Now, of course, we knew that policy of, of uh, firms. We recognized that it some, sometimes the, the extra requests were justified, but not always. They simply wanted to compensate for their too low, uh, too low offer. The trouble was we could not discuss that openly because CERN has a finance committee where any financial uh, uh, decisions have to be approved. If we would have gone to the finance committee and said, look, we came to a compromise with the firm, we propose to pay them a little bit more, this would have been known through the firms immediately and they would have, costed, would have asked for more money. So Emilio and myself, just the two of us, very often had meetings with the top people, top CEO of the tunneling firms, and we are negotiating with them like horse traders how much money we were prepared to give them, how much not. And uh, they explained that could not be done in the open. They uh, really had to trust, have, had to full trust with Emilio what he was proposing. So I think that was done in full harmony. It was not easy. Uh, well, uh, however, sometimes when there are problems, Emilio was writing to me an, an internal note, but in Italian. And in fact, recently I had met uh, Henri Laporte, and he told me that at that time he had asked Emilio, why are you writing letters in Italian to Chopin? Well, he said, the answer of Emilio was, first of all, he, said, he understands it. And secondly, he said, if I write to him in Italian, he will ask the same question, why I'm writing to him in Italian. So he will uh, notice that there's something special, and he will give more attention to it than if I write to him in English. So Emilio was a very good negotiator, a very good psychologist. Well, then during the lab construction, of course, we had many visits, and here, in the meantime, Chirac had become President of France, here we have a visit of 1987, and uh, we had a little ceremony placing the first lab, mag lab magnet, and you see here Emilio explaining to Chirac and Aubert what's going on. Well, during that visit, was in June 87, 
Chirac asked Emilio, when will the, the project start? And without consulting his collaborators, Emilio said, 14 juillet 1989, the French holiday. So many of, of, the, uh, of his collaborators were shocked because they had not before discussed this date. So Emilio was courageous enough to say that, and indeed, as you will see later, it happened that the date that lab started uh, 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 operation. Well, here you see uh, uh, Emilio with, on the left, left uh, the right Laporte uh, when the tunnel was finished and the machine uh, could be installed. I will, of course, not talk about the machine, about the construction machine, because Steve Myers will cover that later. And here on the first, on, indeed, on the 14th juillet, 1989, was it happened that the first beam went around the uh, lab as Emilio had promised. But at that time, Carlo Rubio had followed me as director general. So uh, uh, you see here the first the picture of the first beam. And the strange thing is that Emilio is not on that picture. I uh, never understood why. He was so modest, so he did not come. Uh, well, let me make a few remarks about the management of the lab project because that, as I mentioned at the beginning, was also completely new at CERN and is quite remarkable. Well, we, of course, we have set up a lab project management board where Emilio was the chairman, he was responsible for it, with uh, the people you mentioned here for the various parts of uh, the project. I insisted to attend the meeting, but only as a listener. I, I uh, interfered only one moment, which I'll mention later, Otherwise, I just listen to understand what's going on. So Emilio had full responsibility, and here you see the name of all the people who were quite essential for the for them. As I mentioned, uh, we did not get any additional money for this project. You see, the, you see here the budget from the foundation of CERN in 1954 went up exponentially. Then it had a peak when the two ex laboratories existed, lab one and uh, CERN 1 and CERN 1 2. And when we built lab, then it went down to the so called constant budget. The constant budget had two light wiggles that happened when Spain and Portugal joined CERN. So part of their contribution was used for, for the program of CERN, but only part, part was used to reduce the, the contribution of the other member states. Now, the cash flow of a project like, uh, like a lab, one billion or so, the cash flow is a, a Gaussian curve, a bell curve. How can you accommodate a bell curve in a constant budget? Impossible. You have to cut off somehow the peak of the expenses. And what do you do? One has to make debts. So I had to go to council and ask, can we make, take a loan from a bank? Council said no. So in the end, we had to take a loan from the pension fund of CERN, which is independent, and they were happy because we had to guarantee them a, a, a fixed uh, uh, income. Uh, so you see, the right, you see the curve, which is, was the cash flow, and then what we did to cut off that peak. This happened at, at uh, LAP, and unfortunately also became a customer at CERN now. When the LHC project was approved, same problem, the said, council said, constant budget, and this time the only difference was they allowed CERN to take debts for the bank, but now CERN has to be, pay back these debts. This caused, of course, uh, all kinds of problems. Now, a very special thing, which I'm uh, 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 very proud, and Emilio should be proud with it, is how we managed the, the project. Normally, if we have a project with a total budget, you distribute that budget, give it to the various sections for the various components, and everybody gets so much money, and for that he has to build his stuff. That we did not do. We agreed with Emilio, we would, we, it was known what the total sum would be, but we kept secret how much was foreseen for the various sections. The only three people who knew about it was Emilio, Müller, Bourgler, and myself. And we told each of the people who were responsible for the magnets, for the uh, RF, and for vacuum, and what have you, you do your job as cheap as possible. 
The surprising thing was, in the end, for those parts which needed a lot of imagination, new technologies, new inventions, like vacuum, like RF, like uh, magnets, those parts came out cheaper. Whereas those parts, which you can buy from the shelf, ready made by industry, came out more expensive. Fortunately, these two things compensated, and only by that uh, kind of management, we could build lab for the for money for seed and also more or less within the time. And I must say, I think this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, managing a project, to my mind, is much more uh, uh, efficient, and much more successful. Of course, it rests on the confidence you have on the people who are responsible for the different components. You have to have confidence in the staff. Nowadays, modern management methods are completely different. Nowadays, you try to control every little uh, step by computing, and uh, people, I talk to various people other projects, they say, oh, I know what's going on everywhere, every day, exactly. In that way, you demotivate people, because people feel that to be a little road, a little wheel in a, in a big uh, machinery, and they don't feel their personal uh, contribution. So I think that is a, a, a management style which is interesting. In fact, uh, even outside people getting interested, uh, I had been invited once and now CERN is invited regularly more or less to the World Economic Forum in Davos where they're discussing management methods. Well, uh, just to, to mention in another interview to in, in, uh, entertain you, CERN Council came to the, idea, to the conclusion that science at CERN is good, but is the management okay? So they set up a group, the so-called Abraham Committee, Abraham was a uh, very well-known French physicist, to check the management of CERN. And this group consisted essentially of very high-level industrialists. When they met the first time, they didn't know each other, so Abraham was dis distributing jobs between them, and finally he had nobody assigned yet to look at the finances. So there was a Spanish gentleman sitting there, and they asked him, uh, do you know something about finances? Could you take care of the finances of CERN? He said, yes, I had been five years minister of finance in Spain. So that was a committee. The Italian delegate was Benedetti from Olivetti. He asked me, How, what is the turnover of staff at CERN every year? I said about four, five, six percent. Oh, he said, then CERN is completely sclerotic. So I asked him, what is the turnover of staff at Olivetti? He said, 30 percent. So I said, how do you do that? Do you fire really people if they are not no good? And since his personal manager was standing next to him, he could not lie. So he, he said, no, no. So I said, how are you doing? So the personal manager said, well, we have an early retirement program which is paid by the Italian state. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, the only, I would say, the only uh, relevant proposal which this committee made was CERN should introduce an early retirement program, which was done. And, but the, uh, when it was discussed in council, said, yes, but somebody has to compensate the, the pension fund. Council said, you introduce the early retirement program and it's your, your job to find a, a way out with the pension fund. Well, this program was installed and with the consequences that the third staff, which at that time was about 3,500, is now going down to 2,500, in spite of getting more, more tasks to do, that could only be done by outsourcing. Huh? The, the modern version of management, again, is outsourcing, so CERN had to outsource more things. To my opinion, this has led that some of the services of CERN are worse now before, and no, not much money was saved. So many of these modern management methods become a fashion, are introduced without being sure that they will help. So, okay, this pension fund, again, was a problem which caused a lot of human problems inside CERN. And here again, Emilio was one who was important uh, to, to help uh, problem solve. Lab experiments. Well, 
Ugo Abaldi will talk about this later. So let me make only a few general remarks how we introduced these experiments and uh, some decisions we took. Because again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was the first time at CERN that we could not give any money to the experiments. So uh, the trouble was, as I mentioned, we had possibility of approving four experiments, but we had proposal for six experiments. So there were two possibilities. We either follow the American procedure, uh, shoot out problem. Huh? We approve four and say the other two go home. We didn't want to do that because lab was a unique facility in the world. So we thought that every physicist in the world who wanted to work there should get a chance. So instead of just disapproving two experiments, we organized a workshop, a kind of marriage market, where we tried to bring physicists together and convince them that they should come to an agreement uh, and uh, to work together on four experiments. Well, I won't go into, into the details, but the outcome was, indeed, in the end, four experiments were approved. And there, there, is a, there was a very interesting sociological experience I made. Two of the ex experiments had very strong leaders, spokesmen, as they called. In fact, two Nobel Prize winners, one was Jack Steinberger, the other one, uh, uh, Sam Ting, two Americans. The other two ex experiments, had two Italian spokesmen. One was Ugo Ebaldi, one Aldo Michelini. You see them on the left there, the thing is right. And they were much more democratically minded than the two Americans. So I said, OK, that will be an interesting experiment. I mean, it was the first time that experiments, which are called experiments, really had to become international organizations. I mean, they are completely more or less independent of CERN because they had to find the resources from all over the world. They had to organize it and so on. They had their own committees and so practically independent organizations. So I thought, well, it's such a complicated uh, thing. Might work with two strong leaders, but I was not sure whether it would work with the two democratic leaders. To my surprise, all four experiments worked beautifully, equally well. And the model for the later LHC experiments were not the two experiments with strong leaders, but with these two democratic leaders. All the, LEPIC, the LHC experiments now have followed the democratic model and not the model of the strong leaders. So that is social. And well, at that time, that was the first step to make CERN really a world lab. You see here the curve, the right, the right curve, which is the uh, uh, outside uh, uh, scientists from all over the world, from the United States, whereas the green curve is where the physicists from member states working in the United States. It was the first time that we had more Americans at CERN than, than Europeans working in, uh, in, in the United States. Well, as I said before, I intervened only once in the, in the lab uh, management board. That was when we decided what should be the maximum energy the magnets should take. These were very special magnets. And I had one experience for the physicists. I would like to tell a story. When I was, when Daisy in Hamburg uh, designed their first E plus E minus storage in Doris. Jenschke was the director of DAISY, went round to the theorists and asked them, what is the highest reasonable energy for the plus machine? And you will be surprised, he asked all the most famous theoreticians in the world. The answer was two and a half GV. And the, answer, the reason they gave was very good. They said, we know that the quantum mechanic point cross section goes down with 1 over s, the square of the energy, and with all the form, we know that all the form factors are smaller than 1. So with the luminosities, which is the number of collisions, you hope to get, you will never, never be able to see anything interesting above 2.5 GV. Jenschke was, did not trust the theories. And he said the magnet is not the most expensive part of the project, so the magnet should go up to 5 GV. So Doris went up to 5 GV, and therefore Doris could do later all the physics for epsilon and j psi, which was not foreseen by theorists. 
So when we discussed the lab magnets, I was remembering that, that don't trust theories. And they said the lab magnets were not the most expensive part, so I insisted that the lab magnet should go up to 125 GV. Therefore, lab could have discovered the Higgs, which was discovered only last year at LHC, if it would have had more time to run. But OK, that's the Pipasanti. Well, during the construction, of course, we had many visits of, uh, of important people. One of them was Mrs. Setcher, who came very charming, said, look, I'm coming not as a, a prime minister, but uh, I'm coming as a fellow scientist. She had it some degree. So she asked the question, what will be the size of the next string after lab at CERN? Uh, well, first, first she asked why are we building a lab as a round machine, not as two colliders? And uh, well, we discussed with her, and in fact, Emilio could explain to her that the energy of a the cost of a collider go up linearly as a round machine in more quadratic curve, and there's a crossover, and lab is still below the crossover for a round machine. So she accepted that. But then she asked what will be the size of the next ring at CERN. I said, there won't be a bigger ring at, at CERN. He said, why should I trust you? She said, I was here as when I was minister. And I talked to John Adams when he built the SPS six kilometers ring. And I asked him what would be, would be the size of the next string. And he told me there wouldn't be a, a bigger ring at CERN. So uh, she said, why sh should I trust you more than John Adams? So we will see who is right in the end, whether there will be a bigger ring. There are some ideas now at CERN to build even bigger ring. Also, I had the visit of the Pope, John Paul II. And uh, I explained to him that we are producing collisions with particles, producing a high concentration of, of energy, uh, energy density, and out of this energy density, we create matter, and we repeat in a way what happened at the Big Bang of, at the uh, beginning of the universe. He said, what, you create matter? He said, creation is my business. You have nothing to do with creation. What you, at best you can do, you produce better. So I had a long discussion with him, and we agreed that there cannot be a conflict between science and religion. And after that, I asked him, and I think I must tell the story here in Pisa, I asked him, why, why don't you habilitate Galileo, who at that time, he was still uh, condemned. And he told me, look, there's no document signed by a pope against Galileo. It was the Inquisition who condemned him. So uh, as a pope, I cannot do anything. I have to convince the Holy Office to do something. And the chairman of the Holy Office at that time was Cardinal Ratzinger. So I said, I have to <laughs> convince Ratzinger, which he did in a few years. He visited CERN in uh, 83, and I think in 86 or so, Galileo was rehabilitated. Okay, at the end of the project, Emilio gave me this document. Six stages of a project. First, there's wild enthusiasm. Second, total confusion. Third, complete disillusionment. Fourth, search for the guilty. Fifth, punishment of the innocent. And sixth, promotion of the non-participants. Emilio Picasso. So, I think this shows of the deep understanding of human nature of Emilio. Well, I deplore very much that Emilio could not see lab three, and I would call it with the LHC, all the beautiful results which could be obtained in the machine which was built in the tunnel which Emilio built. I deplore that very much. And uh, well, CERN had his sixth anniversary last year. But we physicists think in the long term in, uh, magnitudes. So I asked the question, what will be the situation in 600 years from now? Well, in 600 years, archaeologists will excavate the tunnel. By that time, uh, all written evidence or even digital uh, information will have disappeared. So historians will think, what, why did they build the tunnel? And they will not find out what it was. So in the end, they will say, well, certainly it must have been a, 
place, a place, place of workshop like Stone Edge. Well, whatever it is, I think it will remain a historical monument to remember Emilio. And that's, I think, how I and we all remember Emilio, always optimistic, always full of life. Thank you. Thank Herbie Chopper for this uh, very, very interesting uh, illustration of the complexity of this project, uh, at least of some of the uh, major managerial and, and technical problem. Uh, and uh, uh, so now we will continue with Steve uh, Myers, uh, who will tell us uh, about uh, the construction or the E plus E minus collider and uh, its uh, exploitation. Thank you very much. Um, I'll speak more about operations. Sorry, that, I'm sorry. Let me just say a few words of introduction. Very, very, very few, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Steve uh, has been a CERN. Uh, uh, for more than 40 years. Uh, I believe uh, he started in 72, and uh, he has been uh, a central figure, although sometime uh, in the background for the physicist, uh, let's say, but doing uh, an indispensable and, uh, and, and fantastic job to uh, be able to uh, exploit uh, this accelerator to their best uh, is, uh, is an art which uh, has been uh, constantly refined uh, by, by Steve uh, up to the point uh, he has on all the uh, newspapers that uh, uh, the, the sensitivity to the dimension, to the physical dimension of LEP uh, uh, was uh, such uh, that uh, the influence of the moon, terrestrial uh, tides, uh, uh, could, could very well be detected uh, uh, by exploiting the accuracy with which uh, uh, the rotational frequency of the spin of, of the electrons around the ring. And <laughs> this is, of course, uh, not uh, the, main, the main achievement, but it shows uh, the quality of the, of, of the exploitation. And it is uh, on the basis uh, of, the, of the quality of the results, uh, the LEP uh, not only produced uh, a great physicists uh, in the realm of, of the relatively well understood and known, but profiting uh, from the uh, great improvement of the theoretical calculation of the <coughs> Uh, of the radiative corrections uh, according to the standard model was able to point uh, uh, very well the way, the way to the future. It, it was, uh, you could predict uh, the mass uh, of the top and uh, you could put a lower limit uh, uh, on the mass of the LHC which both uh, have been shown to be uh, correct uh, and realistic. And, uh, of course, uh, after LEP, uh, Steve uh, has continued with his contribution and uh, his uh, contribution to uh, LHC, uh, particularly in the, in the last phases of uh, construction and, uh, and exploitation. And now, uh, as head of the medical application of CERN, he, he will continue to give us uh, great benefits from his activity. So, please. Thank, thank you very much. So, um, I'll talk a little bit more about LEP operations, and as the title said, it's uh, in memory of uh, someone I consider to have been a great man, Emilio. Um, so, this was very early on. This was the initial commissioning 
And you see, in those days, we didn't even have PowerPoint. You had to write things with a pen and, and have some alcohol in your pocket in case you made a mistake so you could change it. So 1989, in actual fact, the, the, we were supposed to switch on the machine on the 15th of July her week because we, it was too political to switch it on on the 14th. But just by accident, we did it on the 14th at quarter to midnight. So it was 15 minutes too soon. So Emilio turned out to be right in the end. Uh, and it was, it was not as easy as turning on LHC, I must admit. We got a single turn and it took us about 50 minutes. And Albert Hoffman said, that's not so impressive, it's only 32 kilometers per hour. And uh, so this was the sort of attitude which Albert usually had. Um, so we were one day ahead of schedule on a, on a calendar, but 15 minutes ahead of schedule if you, if you count it accurately. It took us a little while to get 18 turns and then a few days to get to capture the beam. And you see that by basically by the end of the month we were starting to do E plus, E minus. Interesting thing was that by two and a half weeks later, I, I know you can't see this, but it's the only one I have, um, we reached the design intensity after, in one beam after about three weeks, which, is, which was really impressive. And then we continued on, but of course, it was, LEP was a difficult machine to uh, operate, and the main reason for that was the control system and the uh, beam instrumentation. And that's one of the things which we learned in preparation for the LHC. So this was the commissioning, and you see again um, that Emilio wasn't here, but he, he was in the control room almost every day, but he wasn't in one of our big crowds like this. And you can see someone who's a lot younger than the guy in front of you at the moment, and Gunter Plass and some of the other people around there, and you see Hervig in the back as well, uh, and Freddie buller Broglin, and people from um, Slack, I think that's Alex Chow, we had a lot of people in the control room that day. Now, this is Emilio when there's only a few people around, and we joked about this photograph many, many times because it looks like he has his hand in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, we, we used to put little captions below it and so on. Uh, he thought this was very, very funny. Um, so then we went on. We, as I said before, we got up to the design current, and then we actually, on the 19th, there was uh, Carlo Rubia, the incoming DG, and, uh, and Hervig. And there was something written in The Economist, uh, which people thought were, was quite hilarious. It said that the results from California are impressive. That was SLC, especially as they come from a new and unique type of machine. They may provide a sure answer to the general generation problem before LEP does. This explains the haste with which the finishing touches have been applied to LEP. The 21 kilometer, uh, 21 long, 21 kilometer long device, six years in the making, it's a little bit more than that, uh, was transformed from inert hardware to working machine in just four weeks. A prodigious feat, unthinkable anywhere but at CERN. And then they went on to say, even so, it was still not as quick as Dr. Carlo Rubio, CERN's domineering director general, might have liked. So, uh, so why is it so big? Um, you've heard the, the, the starting with 50 kilometers, going down to 30, going to 27, going to 22, going back to 27. Um, really, it's all about synchrotron radiation and electron machines. The synchrotron radiation goes with the fourth part of the, of the beam energy. So you want, if you want a high energy, you need a a very soft bending radius. That's why the magnets had very small, strong, very uh, weak fields, and why they were actually copper, they, they were actually concrete uh, iron magnets, and why um, was a good, a, a very good decision to make, the, allow them to go to 125 GeV. Now you see from this as well. I don't want to go through the de details here, but uh, with with conventional uh, room temperature cavities, the power goes with the energy goes with the eighth power, whereas with superconducting it only goes with the fourth power. So for the first stage, since we staged this machine, the first stage was lower energy, just under 50 GeV, and with standard room temperature, uh, room temperature cavities. Later on for the higher energies, we needed to go to uh, much, much uh, higher field gradients in the, in, in the, in the cavities. 
The performance, this is a, just a summary of the history of the performance. Uh, we started in 88, we did an octant test. There was a lot of discussion about whether it was worthwhile or not, but it turned out to be extremely worthwhile because we found the coupling in the magnets due to the nickel layer, and we corrected that between 89 and, 88 and, 8 and 90, actually. First turn was on 14th of July, first collisions on the 13th of August, and we did the first pilot physics run in the uh, middle of August. Uh, we stopped from time to time to do accelerator physics, 1990 to 1994, we did the Z0, that was the lower energy physics. And then we started the pushing the energy. 95, we went from 65, 70 GeV. 96, we went 80.5 up to 86. 97, we reached 92. And 98, we made 90, almost 95. And 99, we made 102. And then the last year of running, the maximum energy we reached was 104.4 GeV per beam. Now, this you can see that uh, since the synchrotron radiation losses go with the fourth power of energy, to do this you need an incredible amount of accelerating uh, gradient in, in, the, in the cavities. And this is just a, a, a tabular form of the performance. You see the year on the first column, the luminosity. The luminosity is just the number of events we produce. The beam energy, KB is the number of bunches. And the total current, which is important as well as, as a limitation, and the peak luminosity. And finally, on the right-hand column, is the dreaded parameter for all the E plus, E minus, the beam-beam tune shift, uh, how normally that's a fundamental limitation to the accelerators. And you can see that we started with a fairly small number and finally got it up to what was and still is a world record, 0 0.08. Um, now, the modes of operation to do this every year, well, we, we invented this workshop in Chamonix um, uh, every January. And in, work, in, the gen, in the January workshop, we looked back on what we'd done the year before, and then we prepared for the year after. And you can see from this that um, in these three columns, uh, optics were changed almost every year, uh, and the bunch scheme, because in a single ring collider, there's a strong limitation to the number of bunches you can put in. You can easily figure out if you put in one bunch per beam, they'll collide in two points. And if you put in 20 bunches per beam, they'll collide in 40 points. So you don't want them to collide in those regions where there are no detectors. So what you want to do is separate them in, in, the, non, in the regions where they would normally collide, but uh, there are no detectors. And that we had various schemes for that. We had uh, we had uh, so-called pretzel schemes, which make the beam go like a pretzel, so they miss each other. And we had other types of schemes, like bunch trains. And we tried these out continuously to increase the number of bunches or the number of the rate of collisions in the wanted collision points. Now, this meant that every single year we started up LEP, it was a new machine. And that was uh, quite, quite a challenge. And as I said before, pushing up that energy uh, uh, all the way from 45 up to over 100 GeV needed a lot of RF voltage. And here you see that um, this is the RF going from 3,100 uh, 3, megavolts up to um, 3,600 in the, in the last stage. In the beginning, we had a very small amount of voltage. Now, this was the period from 1999 to... Uh, during 1999, actually. So what we, the way we did this, because the RF was so crucial, we run the machine at an energy where we had a little bit of RF margin. So if one of the cavities dripped, you didn't lose the beam. So the way we did this was we increased the voltage gradually in this condition, uh, and we established a margin. And then we brought the beam uh, energy up a little bit. And then we did the same again, and then we brought the beam. So we always had enough voltage so that if some of the cavities tripped, uh, we would not always lose the beam. And we, we, this is the, the pr procedure here of doing that. This shows you the design against what was achieved in terms of the parameters uh, which are very relevant for this machine. But first one is the bunch current, then there's the total current. All these various fundamental limitations. And you see that in reality, we uh, exceeded the design by a substantial amount, sometimes by a factor of 10, sometimes by a factor of 1.5 to 2. 
Now, all of this is um, for me interesting, but for the normal people not so interesting. So it's probably more interesting to talk about what was, for, what was unforeseen and what was unexpected. And we had a lot of those things. In actual fact, some of the people who were working in the control room at the time have compiled a, a little sort of chapter for a book sometime called Memories of, of, of LEP, Funny Memories of LEP. This was not so funny. This was the um, unexpected result where we had um, the detectors for measuring the field were heating up and risk to melt in all of the ca cavities. We had 272 cavities and we had uh, two times that number of these antenna and they were deeply inside the superconducting magnet and we knew they were warming up and some calculations had been done to put this 8 watt limit on it and what we had to do was never go beyond 8 watts otherwise these antenna would melt and we'd be out of business for, for quite a long time. So we had to do very strange things about changing the parameters of the beam. Uh, here, those people who were involved at the time will realize it. But this is another situation where we had, when we switched on, after every Chamonix meeting, we usually changed the optics, which meant changing uh, the way in which you powered the magnets. So on one of the occasions, uh, we found that we had repeated trips after somewhere between 10 and 30 minutes. And the time between the trips decreases with time. So if you leave them running for, for 10 minutes, next time it trips after two minutes. And so we, weren't, we didn't know what was going wrong. And we sent a, an enormous number of teams around the machine to look at the bus bar. And you see from all of these, they're all going north to south except this one. <laughs> so someone had put this one on the wrong way. And it was just a perfect bimetal strip when it warms up it shorted out, and depending on how hot it was, t told you how long. So we, there were several thousand of these around the machine, so we, we, we actually found this. But even looking at it now, it's not so obvious if you open a cabinet and look in and see this. Yeah. The other thing we saw was that because the, the, the calculation of the, of the energy or the precision of knowing the energy in LEP was a fundamental parameter for the physicists, so they, that's their parameter for measure, the parameters for which they were measuring. And we found the energy was fluctuating for many things. One of the things was the water level of Lake Geneva. When the water level of Lake Geneva was going up and down and they were opening the slice gates, they were having an effect on the energy of the ring just due to the, the, the pressures changing the, the circumference of the, of, the, of the machine by a tiny amount. The other one, of course, which everyone has read about and seen is this was the... the um, it was very unexpected, and I must say, we, we, we saw, we measured this first, and no one really thought of it. Albert Hoffman went off to Slack on a discussion, and someone in a joke over coffee said, have you thought about tidal forces, the forces of the sun and, and the moon? And then they started doing some calculations, and they found it fitted really well. And this is, on the left, you see uh, the blue is the calculation of the tidal forces, and the red points are the measurements. It's absolutely perfect correlation. It's a very expensive way to measure tidal forces, but we did it. Uh, and more importantly, afterwards, we used the tidal forces calculations to calibrate the energy of the beam as a function of time. Now, this was another one. We've, we're measuring the beam energy. You see here, the, the, here you have the measurement of the beam energy as a function of time along, along the bottom. And you see that it's very, very noisy, there's a lot of, and then all of a sudden it gets very calm, and then after a certain time it gets very noisy again. And of course, this is great for the physicists, they can measure the beam energy very accurately, but this is a bit of a mess. And you see that it always got quiet at midnight, and then started getting noisy again at five o'clock in the morning. And um, this was very confusing for us because the first time we did the measurement, we did it over a two day period, and we had a perfect calm signal with no noise. So after a lot of discussions, I sat on the Jura Mountains looking for planes coming in and out to see if that was causing it because they don't come in and out between midnight and five in the morning. We did all sorts of things like this. We found out it was coming from the TGV. Uh, and it just so happens that when we did the first measurements, the train workers were on strike that week. So we had a perfectly clean signal, and that, 
Now, what was happening was the TGV in the French part was not well as well insulated as in the Swiss part, so the, the currents which drive the TGV to make it go to Paris uh, come round, go through from uh, this place close to Meyron, Zimeza, go on to the vacuum pipe, go around the vacuum pipe in Lep, and then reach the Versoire River and come back through the Versoire River uh, back to make a loop. And this was polarizing, repolarizing the magnetic field and changing the magnetic field by a tiny amount, but putting noise on it as well. And we managed to do this and we managed to find out where it was coming from. And again, we managed to compensate for it. There were even, even more unexpected things. Um, I was away at the time and we couldn't get the beam to circulate for more than 15 turns in the machine. So this is, this is really an accelerator physics nightmare when the beam just won't go around because normally it's very, very, if, you, if the beam is going around, you have diagnostics and you can find out what's going on. If it's not going around, it's difficult. Fortunately, for this turn on and left, we had, we had devised this scheme to, if we couldn't get the beam to go around, what we would do, to, what we would measure. And the scheme is basically you put in, you make the beam make a, a, an oscillation like this and you use the pickups round and it should be, if you do it normalized, it should be just a, almost a perfect sinusoidal beta-tron oscillation going round. And here you see it is a perfect going from left to right, which is the positrons for that case. It's a, a very nice sinusoid and then it stops at a certain point. And this point was QL10, left of one. That means this is a quadrupole. It's around point one, and it's on the left, and it's 10 quadrupoles to the left. We did the same thing with the electrons going around the other way, and we got the same sinusoid stopping more or less at the same place. So we went down into the tunnel at this um, quadrupole, uh, and this is it here. And you see on either side of it, there's, there are two flanges. Took the flanges off, and I had a look inside and I could see something, I didn't know what it was because it was very shiny and there was something which looked like a, a green concave thing. And uh, it turned out to be a beer bottle inside the vacuum pipe. Uh, and it was a Heineken beer bottle. Uh, so we poked it out with a wooden stick. Uh, with an accelerator, you don't like to open the vacuum in your middle of running because uh, it's the last thing you want to do. But we had to do this. We poked it out and we were about to close up the flanges and go away again. And I reminded the people that, you know, I did my PhD in Belfast, and we were always told if you find one bomb, there's probably another one. So we went to the other side, 10 meters to the right, and we found a second beer bottle. So two beer bottles, and they were both empty. So um, I, um, I think that I still actually, uh, for my retirement, they made me uh, uh, the vacuum pipe of lep with the two beer bottles, one coming out of each side. Uh, the very interesting thing was that at the time, Heineken were advertising the UK as Heineken, the beer that gets to places no other beers can. <laughs> so this was the the black one is the performance in 2000. And you see all the other years there as well. Um, it was a very productive uh, accelerator. Uh, these are the peak luminosity. These are the thing which the physicists really, they need high peak luminosity for lots of events for statistics. Um, this is the delivered amount of data per day. You see it's going up continuously um, through the period of LEP1, which was low energy, into LEP2. Now the performance in 2000 was, it's important that the energy, you see the energy here is from 100 GeV to 104.5. The peak of it was done at 103, 103.5, and this was because we thought we were seeing the first signs of the Higgs boson then. Um, these are the cavity gradients, which for the RF guys is absolutely um, so important. One, one, the only thing you can see from this is that there's quite a spread in the, in the gradient of the cavities, and you have to take that into account when you're running the machine. Amazingly, we reached a total value of 3,641 megavolts of accelerating voltage per turn on the machine. Um, I mean, this is 3.6 gigavolts of, of, of a, if you want, a LINAC, if it were all put together. It's an incredible amount of uh, accelerating gradient. And nearly all of this was being lost uh, as synchrotron radiation inside the vacuum pipe. When we were running at high energy, we had 20 megawatts of synchrotron radiation being um, 
being dissipated in the chambers. And there's some very funny stories about that as well. Now then came 2000 and we had the decision whether to stop LEP or not. Um, the, it was a lot of very intense discussion. The question was LEP versus LHC, the old versus the new. Uh, there were lots of comments made about LEP would delay. If LEP continued running, it would delay LHC by anything between zero up to two, two three years. There was competition from the Tevatron. Probably the most important thing was that the manpower transfers needed to the LHC from LEP would not have been able to be done then. And there was also the materials budget, there was electrical power and so on needed to run LEP. And it, CERN, in my opinion, was totally divided at this time. It's almost like a civil war. Uh, there was no consensus. Uh, it was very, very difficult and very, very difficult decisions. <coughs> uh, I tried to put through uh, sort of month by month. Ugo probably remembers it much better than I do. On middle of June, there were the first candidates for Higgs. The problem here was one experiment initially and then two experiments and then maybe even three experiments thought they saw the Higgs at a certain energy, 114.5 GeV. Um, so the first candidates were in, and Gigi of course so it was in the experiment which, which thought they had it. Uh, 14th of June, first candidate. 20th of June there was the LEP committee and Aleph presented this excess <coughs> at high, high, high masses. Um, then the LEP committee proposed two reserve weeks at the end of September to be granted. We ran and there were events two and three from Aleph and things were starting to look very interesting. On the 5th of September again there was the LEP committee who decides these things. Uh, the excess was only in Aleph, correct me if I'm wrong, Gigi, and only four jets. Uh, how combination, however, agrees with the mass of the Higgs being between 114 and 155 for one of the experiments. There was a request for a two-month extension in order to double the amount of luminosity at this energy. Uh, and of course, in the usual compromise situation, uh, one month was granted, not two. Uh, things were getting fairly uh, serious at CERN. And on, by October, uh, LEPC had an update on the results and the signal was up to 2.6 sigma. Uh, 16th of October, uh, there was one missing energy candidate from L3. So that meant more than one experiment. And November 2nd was the end of LEP operations. Because of only the one month, we didn't double the sample. We only increased it by 50%. Uh, the next day in the LEPC, the new data confirmed the excess again. The significance grows to 2.9. It's getting very, very interesting. There was a request to run LEP through 2001. Uh, you, you remember that this is around 2000 when we were supposed to be running LHC much sooner than we actually did. Um, so in November, there were, in the closed session of the LEPC, it was actually... Uh, in the LEPC on the research board, I've never seen such a clean split. It was eight versus eight. I mean, it was eight for and eight against. And in the end, um, I think the DG had to decide that, as was we were told, LEP has closed for the last time. <coughs> the additional running in 2001 wasn't granted, so LEP was going to be dismantled uh, in, in favor of, uh, of the LHC. I must say it wasn't a popular decision, particularly with, with us guys at the time. Um, the, for us, it looked as though this was, this was, this was something which was real and so on. In the end, it was the right decision. And uh, uh, So we had a pretty sad occasion um, pulling the plug for the last time on the machine. And this was the last beam being dumped. And interestingly enough, you see the people who were there. They're all the people who worked on LHC afterwards, which is really very strange. Um, so what's the legacy of LEP? I think there's a lot of it. There's the physics data, obviously, luminosity, very, very precise, precise measurements. For us, the experience in running large accelerators, there's a lot of experience that's been gained there, which has been applied to the LHC. The technical requirements to control a large-scale facility uh, operational procedures, we learned so much from LEP and we wanted not to make the same mistakes in, in LHC that we made 
in the early stages in LEP. There was things about orbit optimization on long machines, alignment, ground measurement, designing and running a large scale, um, in this case RF system, and taking care of things which, which cause you not to be able to get enough beam in the machine. The other thing which for future, if there's ever a future E plus E minus ring collider, this business of the ultra strong damping at very high energies, we had very strong damping of the beams due to synchrotron radiation, and this caused us to allow the, to produce much more performance. But for me, the most important thing was when we got over and had the wake for LEP, we um, brought the whole team to work on, on the LHC, and this was al already in February 2001. Uh, we started up the LHC commissioning committee, and you see the names of the people at the bottom on the very first meeting of this committee, and it's all the people who have been running and were very much involved in, in the LHC right through until, um, until the discovery in 2012 and 13. So I think that was a big challenge, a lot of effort, and very rewarding. Physics was exceptional. Uh, the LEP accelerator achievements were based on the work of many hundreds of people. Uh, I was surprised to find that we had produced something like 550 papers from the proceedings of Chamonix. Most people believe it was a fantastic exper experience which none of us will ever forget. Emilio was the project leader throughout the construction and the initial running. And he, I know, was uh, rightfully enormously proud of the performance of what he called his machine. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve, but don't go away. There may be questions or comments. No? Well, th 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 there is a comment uh, that uh, I, I believe uh, some wisdom can be extracted uh, from what you said and from what uh, Herwig said uh, in connection with very big uh, uh, projects. These big projects... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I was talking about wisdom to be extracted from some aspect of these two talks uh, in connection to very big projects. Uh, you learn a lot while uh, uh, building, construct, I mean, first conceiving, then approve, getting approved, and then building and running one of these uh, big projects. Eh? Uh, uh, but uh, the, the tendency is also to soon forget what, uh, at the time, uh, you feel that uh, you have learned. And uh, when uh, you see now, uh, you know, lots of people talking about uh, future problem in which uh, the dimension in one space or another uh, grow by a considerable factor, uh, to risk forgetting uh, uh, the previous experience uh, is, uh, is a great risk. And uh, this applies to questions like uh, all the sociological and technical uh, aspects uh, of uh, uh, building a machine of a very large size uh, with all its implications. And it, and it goes uh, into uh, considering, uh, I, I understand very well, that the team uh, operating uh, uh, LEP uh, felt uh, that uh, he, he, he wanted to look and, and, and find whatever there was just beyond, uh, beyond their limit. But uh, the inertia of this uh, large, big problem uh, is such that uh, I'm afraid a person like uh, the DG CERN finds himself uh, indeed split, but uh, the duty of a good director general is to resolve uh, this kind of uh, possibilities. And uh, <clears throat> you must accept, when you get uh, LHC approved, you must accept uh, that uh, it has uh, a mass uh, and a consequent inertia such that uh, you cannot uh, interfere even 
even for the purpose of physics. Once upon a time, uh, uh, any operator of an accelerator would have pushed as much as possible to get whatever results uh, was uh, just beyond the limit. The example is in, in, in Frascati, when uh, with Dadone, uh, they went beyond that few percent of the design uh, energy to immediately get confirmation of the results that were coming from Brookhaven and from Stanford. And in fact, the three physics uh, review letters were published on the, on the, on the same issue. But uh, when uh, uh, you, you have all the inertia of the big project, you have lost uh, this, uh, this freedom and you must accept it. <laughs> So, if you have more comments, uh, then we're all invited to uh, lunch, and uh, we are supposed to reconvene, uh, I would say, since uh, we end later than foreseen, uh, uh, something like uh, 2.15. Eh? Thank you. Let, let me make... Two, two brief comments before we start. Uh, you know, this morning, <coughs> listening to the talks of uh, Schopper and Steve Myers, I, you know, I thought that the, the, the great thing about uh, uh, CERN and the people that, uh, the, the leaders of the project at CERN, is that... Uh, uh, you know, they have been able to, to, to make such that the entire uh, laboratory had uh, in mind clearly these goals, right? Uh, the building of lab and the building of LHC. And this, uh, I find, uh, uh, is really the way in which uh, things uh, work at CERN. Uh, and I wish that this model would be transferred uh, in other cases. Uh, the, the, the other brief thing that I want to say about Emilio, uh, you know, for various reasons, uh, I am a theorist, Emilio an experimentalist, they are, they are different in age. I have not, never collaborated with Emilio, nor I have uh, been a student of, of his, I have not followed lectures. Um, so, mostly my interaction with, Emilions, with Emilio were... Uh, uh, brief uh, uh, contacts, uh, for example, in the corridors at, at CERN, and I remember that, uh, I'm sure that I'm not the only one, I remember that the way he was always addressing to me was the following, right? The beginning was stopping me and saying, hey, ragazzo, come va? That was the way Emilio, eh? I am sure that other people had the same, uh, had the same, hey, ragazzo, come va? <laughs> All right, well, so um, uh, this afternoon uh, we start with uh, Giorgio Brianti. Uh, I want to say briefly that uh, Giorgio, I learned actually uh, today, has been one of the very first engineers uh, um, uh, entering CERN in 1954. And since then <clears throat> he has played uh, a major role in uh, various enterprises. Uh, I recall the construction of the booster, who, uh, which is, a, uh, and still is, I understand, a, 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 a key, a key uh, element in the ejection of the protons in the uh, machines at CERN. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, he has been uh, the key figure at the beginning of the construction of LHC, right? So... Um, uh, he is entitled to, to recall uh, those years, uh, uh, I think, uh, from a, a very uh, relevant position. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Giorgio.
Thank you very much. So, how does it work with this? Or directly on the computer, I suppose. Hmm? Maybe we do it here, no? Maybe I sit down and do it here. Okay? It works. I don't know if you see it very well. Maybe you could uh, blind a bit the window. This um, photograph is dear to me because it was taken a few days in December 1980, a few days before Emilio and I, we started our respective job in the director of every chopper. And this period was a very happy for the three of us in the end. Now, there is two features in this uh, photograph. One is standard and the other is non-standard. The standard one is that Emilio was wearing his classical uh, sweater of good uh, tennis man, as you know, he was a very great tennis man. But the other was that he was not exi exactly the type of person who could be put in a corner, as you see in this uh, photograph. Now, <clears throat> let the uh, switch particle now, we are talking photon. And I go back to the situation of early 1980s. <clears throat> At CERN, the ISR was still running as a proton-proton collider with continuous beam, but there was in full swing the SPS proton-antiproton, which led to the discovery on W and Z by <clears throat> Carlo and then and, uh, Dariula and finally the Nobel Prize to Carlo and uh, Simon. <clears throat> in the USA, maybe because of the former situation, they started the gigantic SSC collider. So the question arose of what to do at CERN for future PP collider beyond the lab. And some people were advocating the idea of joining for Europe joining the SSC. But this was practically impossible because CERN was uh, engaged with the full construction of LAP and uh, any possible participation of Europe would be a very minority participation. But the second most, to me, most important question was what would be the future of CERN beyond uh, LAP? After all, CERN had uh, a number of considerable assets. The tunnel, which is a question you heard uh, this morning, we had already the feeling that it would be a major undertaking, which actually costed blood and tears, as we know. We had an injector complex, which uh, could be very efficiently cover all needs. We are going to acquire cryogenics, not only for the lab experiments. And last but not least, the expertise of people with ISR and PP bar. In the preparatory phase of lab in late 19... Maybe you could switch off the light here, yeah, maybe it's better. It's very visible, I mean. Okay, sorry. During the preparatory phase of lab, one always kept in mind that this uh, tunnel could would serve one day for a proton machine. And I found a, a, a note, handwritten note, by John Adams in 1977, in which he described in one page uh, what he called SPEC, a super proton electron complex. 
with a proton machine in the future lab tunnel of 3.5 TV and then an electron machine. Now, the lab tunnel uh, 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 describe very well all what the, the problem were with the tunnel. There was the circumference and the location which had to do with the electron beam energy. It was, I <clears throat> complete just for two seconds what he said about uh, Genier Lombardi, who was the big expert of tunnel at that time. And I remember vividly a visit of Emilio and myself, only the two of us, in Zurich to Lombardi, uh, where he was, he was advocating that we should get the uh, tunnel out of the Jura as much as possible. In order to impress us, it showed us the video of the major disaster which occurred not far from here on the highway between Rome and L'Aquila during the excavation of the tunnel for the highway. There was a major <coughs> flood with water at 60 atmosphere, 60, <laughs> which uh, occurred, I think it was late 70 or beginning of 80, I forgot now. Fortunately, it occurred during a weekend, so there were no workers at that time. Otherwise, it would have costed <clears throat> several tens of uh, killed people. But there was the question also, the transverse dimension of the tunnel. And uh, I was defending the idea of having relatively large, at least equal to the one of the SPS, in order to install two machines, LEP, and the proton machine. But Erwig was very firm in trying to save money, and so finally the tunnel was a little smaller. At the end, there's no, conquest and no consequence, as you know, because finally the lab was removed before the installation of the LHC. So, in 1982, more than 30 years ago, we start to study what to do how could it look like a proton-proton collider in the lab tunnel, which by definition, it should have been at that time compatible with lab, so simultaneously installed. And this led to the first immediate choice, namely that we could not make two separate machines for the two proton beam, as it was foreseen in the SSC, but we had to adopt the so-called two-in-one magnet structure with, of course, two beam tubes, two sets of coils, but a common mechanical and magnetic structure around it, and therefore one cryost, cryostat only. This constraint turned out to be, in the end, an advantage because it, it saved, to my mind, about 20% of the cost of the magnet because there was a unique and a unique mechanical structure. The next question, which superconductor? Of course, since the tunnel was limited with respect to the perspective SSC1, clearly it should be superconducting magnet, but which, which superconductor? There are the usual two candidates, niobium titanium and niobium 3 tin. We made a model of both, but Niobium 13 was soon discarded because of the difficulty of winding the coil in a non-superconducting state and cook it all up in order to turn it into a superconductor. So we stayed with Niobium Titanium. But then we said, let's gain as much as possible field with the same amount of superconductor. And the idea came of cooling further down which was the first time with respect to a ladder superconducting machine, from 4.2 Kelvin to 1.9. And this produced a gain of about 1.5 Tesla, or a total gain of 1.3 TV for the time machine, which actually is more than a Tevatron. But now, <laughs> going down to 1.9 offered the possibility of using superfluid helium as coolant, superfluid super 
fluid ilium is a quantum state of ilium, which is a special beast. It has certain properties which are negative and some other are very positive. The negative one is a no viscosity and therefore you must be extremely careful with the thousands of wells around the machine in order to avoid leaks. But the positive is that it has a very high heat conductivity. If my memory is right, about 1,000 times the one of copper. So it offers the possibility to keep all the 80 tons of helium static in the machine, not moving, thus avoiding possibility of uh, frozen impurity in valves, condic, and so on, and cooling by a very small stream of, of, of helium-2 flowing in a small conduit throughout uh, <coughs> the magnet. So this initial work, which produced a first report of about 100 pages, prompted the interest of the physics community. And as <coughs> every remember, in 1984, there was a first ECFA CERN Lausanne workshop for the LHC in the lab tunnel. After that, there were other physics workshops, especially one in La Tuile in early 96. But also in 1986, Council uh, established to set up the Long Range Planning Committee to study the future of CERN after LEP. The chairman was Carlo, the member, I don't know if you see it there. The special thing about this committee was that half of the member was Nobel Prize uh, laureates. Sorry, as I was saying, the, uh, half of the members of the committee were laureate, prize laureates. And then in this situation, we can easily see who did the work. Now, the conclusion was that uh, the LHC should be the next uh, lab project, which was a very positive conclusion. Now, we were aware that this would require a lot of preparatory technical work. The problem arises from the higher field. You cannot win on all uh, fronts because the forces and the stored energy square uh, go with the square of the field. This would re require a large cable in the radial dimension with a small superconducting filament for the high precision field and all the, the question of quench protection to which I'll come back. So the forces at CERN were limited because most of the laboratory was engaged for lab, so I tried to call to external participation. And I must say that I got a very good response from INF INFN, especially through LASA in Milan, and then uh, CA, Saclay, and Grenoble. The CA, <coughs> Saclay, specialized in magnets, and Grenoble specialized in cryogenics. And this well uh, is from Grenoble that we got all the hints how to cool magnet with superfluid helium, which was not, never made before in accelerator, but was done in a tokamak in Cadarache in the south of France. So we learned a lot from them how to deal with this. And then in industry, we tried to push the development of wires and cable, make model, uh, coil and your construction model and some prototypes. Now, during this uh, preparatory phase, as I said, most of the uh, uh, laboratory effort was concentrated on lab. But we had all the feeling that we should not abandon the line of the proton-proton uh, collider. And these two requirements, there could be a potential conflict. On my side, I tried to avoid uh, diverting effort from LEP, in particular by calling on external help for the LHC. Emilio, of course, prime interest was LEP, but he was also very much concerned with the future of CERN and encouraged the effort for the LHC. And I'm very grateful for Emilio, to Emilio for this attitude. He continued, of course, to support it well beyond 1989. 
every time I met him in, in the cafeteria when he was actually here but returned to Geneva from time to time, he was asking what's going on with the LHC. Now the design, the basic concept remains always the same. There has been an evolution. In here you have a cross section of the magnet of 87 in where the coal mass was suspended in the cryostat. In 1981, it was like it is today, supported by a small <coughs> uh, loss port. But it looked more complicated than the final one, which is this one, because in the meantime, it was decided to dismantle LEP before installing the LHC. So all the distribution of um, coolant which were obliged to do through all magnet, also where it was necessary, could be transferred out in a so-called uh, cryogenic line, which ran along the machine all around the tunnel. And curiously enough, this uh, in the end was the most, the simplest element of the project and the, the one which caused the <laughs> most problems. But anyhow, is a very compact, the two machine, the two beams, rest within uh, little more than half a meter. The, you see the two sets of coil, the collars, which are austenitic uh, stainless steel, which had the forces or retain the colossal magnetic forces of two mega newton per meter, which tend to flatten the coil. And then around the yoke, the yellow, uh, all contained in a stainless steel cylinder, and all this is immersed in helium at 1.9 degrees, the, probably the coldest space in the universe. Now the coil, I said before that it was necessary to develop a coil of large dimension radially, with a lot of strands, a lot of wire, a lot of turns, and many strands because the total current is 12,000 ampere going through the magnets. These uh, superconductors, which were made, but all, all the industry in the world uh, working in this field are quite amazing. Uh, they start with a bar of niobium titanium of about 200 millimeter diameter, about one meter long, and by extrusion, stacking, wire drawing, etc., and these processes, it becomes finally a 30 kilometer of one meter wire with 9,000 filaments of superconductor inside. Each wire is a quite amazing achievement. This is not made by CERN, it's made by industry. Now, concerning vacuum, one would think that with uh, Cryogenic temperature 1.9, there are no problems with vacuum. It can easily reach very low pressure. But there is a problem because the beam produced some heat, even synchrotron radiation, uh, also image current in the tube, uh, electron beam cloud, and so on. It's a heat of around 1 watt per meter, which seems very small. But to absorb it at 1.9 would be equivalent to the entire cryogenic load of all the magnets. So we are obliged to insert what is called a beam screen, namely a second tube, perforated, in order for the beam to see the pressure as if produced by the outer tube, but cooled at a much higher temperature, between 5 and 20 degrees, and therefore much more economical from the point of view of cryogenics. Now, is a, a glory of INFN, the, the very first real magnet of uh, six, me, six meter long uh, lens at that time, was provided entirely by INFN, and it was constructed by Ansaldo, and this occurred in 1994. <laughs> Now, a very important uh, element on the way of realizing finally a machine was a 100 meter of machine, a real machine installed in a hall, uh, two machine cell, make of dipole quads, 
where everything was tested, including all the problem of cooling, cryogenic handling of this uh, 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 fluid. Finally, the dipole magnet has a nominal field of about 8 Tesla, an overall length of 16.5 meters, a total mass of almost 28 tons. I think is objectively the most difficult object ever built for accelerator. I'm not speaking of the detector. More than 1,200 are installed in the machine and many more were produced. It also the, there is a the complication of the junction between all these, uh, these uh, magnets. Now, some striking number I was speaking before, the beam energy. At full swing, it could be 360 megajoule, equivalent to 77 kilo of TNT, of dynamites, capable of melting 500 kilogram of copper. And this has been demonstrated dramatically in the accident of 208, where a simple opening of a circuit between two magnets produced damage to about one kilometer of the machine. A actually magnet which actually of 27 ton actually taken off the floor. Uh, you see also the magnetic energy of one dipole already is more than one kilo of TNT, but the magnets are arranged in strings of 154 dipole. So each of these strings has 1,000 megajoule with equivalent to 200 kilo of TNT. This shows the difficulty and the problem of being very sure that events like the one of 208 would not occur again. Now, one aspect of the machine which was very much pushed uh, at the beginning by a prospective user was the luminosity. The SSC uh, planned at the beginning 10 to the 33. But there was a big push for 10 to the 34. I do not want to go into the technicality, but the main ingredient are the number of particles per bunch, the number of bunches, and the size of the beam at crossing. So we tried to push on all these elements, in particular including, including the number of bunches. In the SPS, there were six bunches, and there we plan 2,080 bunches, namely the train of <coughs> particles follow seven centimeters apart around the, the ring. Now, I don't resist to the temptation to see what has actually happened. In the 212 uh, run, of course, the beam energy was lower, it was 4 TV for the for beam for the reason of this accident. The bunch pacing was great. The number of bench, uh, bunches were about half the one what was foreseen at that time. But this could be compensated by higher current per bunch and also somewhat better emittance, better quality beam from the injector. So, goal, so that the top luminosity achieved was almost 10 to the 33, and if scaled to the final energy would have been above 10 to 34. And integrated luminosity collected by ATLAS and CMS has been 23 inverse femtobar. So I think it was quite a success, thanks to all the people who work on that. Now, going back to the lab period, this is the photograph of the last directorate under Eric Schopper, with you see Emilio, myself, Dario La, Thresher, Hain, and Martinez, who was an administrator. And it was a very happy period to my mind. But of course, during my time, the LHC was still a dream. What has actually happened was that the real project was approved by end on 94 in a final way in 208. 
and I think many people said is the largest and more sophisticated research instrument ever built. And I want to pay tribute to Lynn and his team who has uh, got through this very difficult construction. From 2009 to 2013, uh, this was scheduled running, and this, uh, the most important person is Steve, who is Myers, who is still with us now, and all his crew. And now we are starting in 2015, a new era at 13 TV under Frederic Bordry, and I hope that it will be equally successful. And I thank you for your attention. that the color committee, color rubia committee, which looked at the future of CERN, had one uh, under committee for, the, for, for LHC, which was chaired by Giorgio Bianti. He was too modest to mention that, so he did all the work for that committee. It was automatic, but it's okay. It's not. I'm sorry. Uh, um, in fact, uh, uh, Hugo uh, is a person with whom uh, um, I have had uh, several contacts uh, to discuss uh, the result of the experiments. Uh, and uh, as I, again, I think you all know, uh, Hugo uh, in. Uh, since uh, many, many years already, is uh, uh, one of the leaders uh, in the uh, construction of mo most advanced um, instruments for uh, hydrotherapy, and in Italy uh, in particular, he has been, uh, and he still is, uh, uh, at the head of uh, a, a main project on that. All right, Hugo, thanks. No. Great pleasure for me to sit here recalling Emilio with Mariella and all of you who loved him and tell you about the physics result. This has been a wonderful time for me and for many of us. So I will speak about the experiments first. We had four experiments, as has been said. The first one in order, alphabetic order is Aleph. Two people have been very important in Italy for this, Lorenzo and Gigi Rolandi. Aleph has a characteristic time projection chamber. In fact, Gigi was the responsible for it, a magnet which was built in Saclay, 1.5 Tesla field, and the time projection chamber work on the principle that electrons drift along the lines of this field, and Gigi has been one of the people who have developed this technique mostly. I bring for every uh, experiment two things which I think are characteristics. One is the measurement of the ionization, the tracks in the TPC 
leave a certain charge, and if they are slow, they have a large ionization, and this can be measured very well. And these are the results of the separation with different type of particles in the TPC of uh, Aleph. And this is the second uh, detector, microversity detector. We speak about that. And this, the group, the NFNPs and university have a lot of, put a lot of effort. And I will come later to the importance of microversity detector in the physics done at LEP. This is Jack He's giving a speech. And Jack, congratulated by Emilio. You see all this, uh, the smile of Emilio. By the way, this is uh, Francis Farley, if you note. And this is another picture taken on the same occasion, uh, this Erwin Gabatula. Alphabetic order, the second one is Delphi. Our speciality was a small TPC, similar to the one of Delphi, but smaller, but around it, a Cherenkov counter called the Rich Counters, which by measuring the Cherenkov light for the first time, I must say, in an experiment of this dimension, could detect the different particles. And uh, uh, this is Delphi in construction, a hand cup, and uh, the, our TPC inserted inside this ring, which is this barrel rich around there is an electromagnetic calorimeter, a gas electromagnetic. We also had a microversity detector, but our detector had three layers from the beginning, and so the, we could get a purity. This is the tagging efficiency towards purity of B quarks, uh, which was uh, not as good as the one in SLD, which is the detector in slack, but a bit better than the others. SLD was better than anybody else because the beam pipe was very small. And so that's easy gain in this game. But it's very important because uh, discovery and studies of the Higgs would have been impossible without the development of microversity detector, which uh, was a really a novelty in this field. Eventually, all the experiments had one. This is a picture of a visit to CERN of uh, President Vaclav Havel. Uh, in 89, and uh, here you see Emilio, you see Carlo speaks always, of course, and we listen to him, and this is even more clear here. I mean, he is explaining, and everybody else is listening to the explanation that uh, Carlo was giving to the president. This uh, visit we had of the French minister Claude Evin in same year, the beginning of LEP, this is Emilio and coming down in the scale of Delphi. The advantage of Delphi, I have quite a lot of pictures with a million uh, shopper and others because we are sitting in uh, P8, which is close by. Aleph was on P2 very far, so not because we are better, but only because we are closer, we got more visits than them. I, I don't want to say anything else. When once uh, uh, Hervey can tell you the story how we got this pit instead of Aleph. Uh, this uh, uh, another visit of Antonio Roberti, a great man, you know, was commissioner, was a very good friend of uh, Emilio, came to visit us at CERN, and here you can see Emilio sitting in front uh, of the, uh, listening to the talk of Roberti with his typical attitude. Very often, you may remember, was sitting in the first row, in the, uh, not sitting behind, but sitting in the first row of the auditorium. Opal. Opal had, uh, was an improved version of a detector which has been uh, built for, J, uh, for Peter Jade when uh, Herwig was director there. It had a chamber which was called the Jet Chamber, uh, developed uh, in Germany, and then it had around it an electromagnetic calorimeter and a very good silicon uh, uh, tungsten luminometer. Measuring the luminosity of LEP was a feat. We had to do it well. When we started, we measured 2%. I show you the latest numbers. Probably you cannot read it, but the best of all was Opal, by the way. You see the change between 92 and 95, and the error was 0.034% in the measurement. This you do by looking to the electron forward, measuring very accurately the electron angle to measure the luminosity. And this Opal did better than anybody else. This is the lead uh, uh, glass blocks uh, 
10,000 uh, of PAL. This is a, was a product of the Japanese group directed by Koshiba, but I cannot refrain to recall here uh, Suji Orita, a good friend, Italian, uh, Japanese friend of Italy, who was in Frascati, who died unfortunately very uh, soon. And uh, I want also to recall that uh, when we had uh, the celebration of Herwig uh, 19th anniversary in CERN uh, a few months ago, uh, Ors Weniger presented a very nice movie on the construction of Opal there, and uh, you can find it on the web. This is Aldo Michelini, and this is uh, Heinz, who was the thesis advisor of uh, the present director general of uh, Ors, uh, uh, of Hoyer, and uh, uh, who worked on the TPC, and this is the picture that you have already seen, taken in '83 at the same time as this picture where you see here Aldo and the other spokesman of uh, but, uh, Ting. Ting is the, was the spokesperson of L3. The L3 was very different from the others. It was a very big magnet, normal magnet, and everything was included in the beam, in this uh, uh, field, a longitudinal field, very low field of uh, Tesla. You see there is here at the center a, a track detector, the electromagnetic calorimeter, BGO, hadronic calorimeter, and the muon chambers, very accurate measurement, all supported by this tube. And this is during the, disc uh, the construction, and uh, this is uh, uh, the BGO. This is made of 11 crystals, very delicate crystal, which have to be calibrated very accurately. And here, for the first time, there was installed inside the, uh, the, the ring, in the, the interaction region, uh, an accelerator, an RFQ, 1.85 MeV, and with protons, this would produce 7.6 MeV gammas, which calibrate the old detector online. This was certainly something nobody had done before. I find it very interesting as a technical challenge. I got from Sam for this meeting some pictures of Emilio visiting uh, L3. You see, this is Emilio down a bit. This is Emilio uh, O'Fallon and uh, Sam on uh, the surface. And then there is a nice picture of uh, also Wolfgang Schnell uh, smiling. And you see, this is very characteristic attitude of Emilio, who was very interested in the experiment. As usually, he would uh, not tell me ragazzo, not often. He would tell ragazzo to my wife, not to me, but he would meet me in the canteen and ask me, how's it going, Hugo? And then I would tell you, and then he would pass to another thing. And so all the years, and I suppose he was doing the same also with the other spokesperson, but of course, at this, I don't know, and only my experience, or so I would do for him on a napkin some schemes if uh, this was necessary to explain an argument. The results. Now, of course, the results I could keep you here busy for two, three hours. So I decided to make a selection and try to make it simple, but uh, it's not simple to explain the results. It was fantastic. This I can say. Oh, Luigi is coming. Thank you, Luigi. <laughs> Thank you. When I see you. Sorry, I was distracted and they went too far. So the results. This is an iconic figure produced by L3 in which you see the cross-section, that is the probability, the number of events, as a function of the energy between 80 GV and 200 GV, which was the energy span of LEP. You see, the largest number of events were in this peak. Here, when we sit here, the plus and minus make a flash of energy which produces Z0, which decays, and this is the decay in two quarks, which then dress in particles. This is the reaction E plus, E minus, quark, anti-quark. This is the largest event. This, is in green, is the cross-section for producing mu pairs, which are heavy uh, electrons, and which has the same shape, of course, the same energy, but they are much less, many less. And then you see that uh, you have events of uh, uh, this uh, type, this, uh, when you uh, 
pass about 160 uh, GV, you have the production of the two intermediate bosons discovered by Carlo Rubia, W plus, W minus. And then, if you go even higher, you have a cross section which is even smaller in producing ZZ. Uh, to uh, Z bosons. So you see, in this graph, you see all the physics, and I find it very interesting. And at LAP, we collected 4.5 million Z experiments, sitting more or less on the peak. The cross section is big, so in the same time, you collect many more events. But above the threshold, that is, when we scan the energy between here and there, in the second LAP to phase, we got only 10,000 events per experiment. So you see, the samples are very different, and the physics also is very different. And I will speak first about three results related to quantum chromodynamics, which uh, have to do with events collected in the channel that we call Q, Q bar, that is production of a, uh, a quark and anti-quark, which then appear in a different form because uh, they are not uh, seen as free particles. Now, to explain this, I have to explain to you what is uh, the strong coupling. The first has to do the measurements of the strong coupling. When you have a quark and uh, it is uh, changing direction because it emits a mediator, which is a gluon, of a certain energy momentum Q. If you increase the energy momentum of this particle, the volume by which, from which uh, this particle comes is smaller because uh, of the indetermination principle. It's very simple. Indetermination principle tells you that if you exchange more energy momentum, then it must come from a smaller region. But uh, what does it mean? That here, there is less energy, because it's Q, than here, in this region. And so, if you look at from the microscopic point of view, in this area you can produce pairs of particles which are relatively light, because there's not enough energy. If you go to uh, this higher Q, when the, the momentum transfer energy is larger, you produce also heavier particles. I throw them as bigger particles, which is not true, but just to give any feeling. So you see, the coupling, which is the probability of emitting a mediator, is influenced by this virtual phenomenon happening there, and it is different when you vary the uh, Q, the energy transmitted. Then, if another core comes, this hits here, and this Q is exchanged, and you have a scattering. But uh, this Q is a parameter on which the coupling, which is the probability of emitting a mediator, changes. And the first measurement that was done, very important in, in this field, has been the measurement of the coupling alpha S, that is, the coupling of a quark to a gluon, strong coupling, alpha S. We had the measurements on the tau decay that this coupling was 0 0.3, which means that every time you look at one quark at this uh, energy of 2 GV, you, uh, you need three times, you have to look at three times before you see that there is a gluon emitted. And in the lab energy range, very accurate measurements have been done, you see around 100 GV, and uh, the number is uh, 0.11. So you must uh, look at this, at this energy eight times before finding a gluon emitter. And this is a running coupling costal, which is a feature of the strong interaction, which was known, but so precisely measurable, was never measured. And as you can see, I put down here the name of Siegfried Betke from Opal, because he's been a, one of the pushers of this physics and has done, given a very many important contribution to this field. Then the second result is the running of the mass of the big quark. When you have a, a, a quark, it's always surrounded by gluons, as I told you, because gluons and other quarks, anti-quark pairs appear and disappear continuously, a virtual phenomena. And this cloud modifies its mass. And this mass, as before, for the same reasons, is energy dependent. And so uh, this effect has been measured at LEP. This is much less known, but to me is one of the most important. In fact, I'm very, very much uh, linked close to this result because we gave a good contribution. The effect has been measured at LEP by comparing the three jet events. What is a three jet event? A three jet event is the one in which a quark and anti quark are produced by this flash of energy, uh, for instance, on the Z peak, and then they adonize because they come out as jet of particles. One of them is a gluon because this has irradiated a gluon with uh, this coupling constant, a strong coupling constant, and uh, this is a quark jet. And I show you here, superimposed, a three-gluon, a three-event which uh, comes out 
from uh, one of our events, which is showing you how this appears in our detector. These tracks, you see there are three jets, and this most probably, you can never be sure, is the radiation of a gluon. And by this, you can measure this uh, uh, mass, I mean, uh, using these three jet events, comparing that is three jet events in which the BB are produced uh, with respect to three jets in which standard light quarks are produced, and you find that the mass of the quark runs, changes with energy which you look at it. At the scale here is about 2.7 GV, as expected by quantum quantum dynamics, at the, the low energy is about 4 GV. And this is another phenomenon which uh, could have been measured but in the very clear events in which you know what is a BB bar, which is the effect of micro microvertex uh, detectors. And then uh, the external third point is experimental proof that one gluon becomes two gluons. This is a fact, a phenomenon which is very clear. You see, you have the standard three jet event, but this gluon now coming out branches in two gluons. This is something which is predicted by the theory of quantum dynamics. Mathematicians and theorists tell you that this is a non Abelian character of uh, this theory and was expected to be there, but nobody had ever seen before. And I must say that one of the things of which in fact, it determined my future life in '90 is that I could present at the first international, uh, this international conference in Singapore, the first experimental measurement of this '90 of the uh, this triple gluon vertex. Then, all the experiment did uh, we did everything much better. And today, if you look in the papers, don't try to understand this. This is a graph in which this phenomenon of the triple gloom vertex is uh, simulated. You see, uh, this is the expectation of the standard model. And uh, uh, this is the uh, area which is uh, now know where the answer has to be. But if uh, our model would be different for theorists, if the group would be SU4, Luigi, for you, SU4, you have been working on SU4 instead of SU3. You may remember, I read that your first paper was SU4. If it was SU4, we should have found here the result, instead it's there. And this is, uh, the, together you see, this is Delphi results, this is Aleph, uh, the green, and this is Opal. And these are other ways of measuring. I don't want to go into detail. But what I want to say is that this is the third very important result. We have this uh, uh, triple gluon vertex, and we have measured very well the SU3 character of this non abelian theory. And behind this figure, there are very many complicated calculations. You cannot believe how difficult it is to compute all this. It's difficult to measure it, but it's more difficult to compute it. And there, I want to come to a point which is very important in talking about physics experiments. I've been writing a book which came out recently particle accelerators from Big Bang physics to hadron therapy, Springer. And in the preface, I start by, uh, and I read to you, what has been written, uh, said by Vicky Weisskopf in 61, 65. There are three kinds of physicists, namely the machine builders, the experimental physicists, and the theoretical physicists. The machine builders are the most important ones, Giorgio. Because if they are, were not there, we would not go get into this small-scale region of space. If we compare this with the discovery of America, the machine builders correspond to captains and shipbuilders who really developed the techniques at that time. The experimentalists were those fellows on the ships who sailed to the other side of the world and then landed on the new island and wrote down what they saw. The theoretical physicists are those who stayed behind in Madrid and told Columbus that he was going to land in India. This is a reason for which in this book... Fair enough, fair enough. He was a theorist, by the way, as everybody knows. But this inspired me in writing this book, because in fact this book is devoted to, as Giorgio knows because he was one of my consultants, is devoted to particle accelerators experts, because without them, so this is the focus only on that. Anyway. What I can tell you, the theorists led by John Ellis and Guido Altarelli at LEP did not stay in Madrid. This I can guarantee you. They were on board, and you were on one of them. And this I say not with my words, but with the words of what uh, John has said for Schopper's 19th birthday, heroic effort by several groups to calculate leading and most important non-leading radiative corrections. 
is a magic word. It's just trying to compute all these gluons and, and uh, pairs of quark, anti-quark, which pop out from vacuum, we attach each other. It's very complicated calculation. Without that, we could not have taken our physics result and transform in physics information. And this is a two of these many yellow book, and this is one which has been contributed and supervised by Guido Altarelli. Everybody knows him. This is a picture which I can go fast, in which also I can see, from which you can see the machine physicist led by Emilio labored very closely with the experimentalist because uh, there, there, there are three tribes and uh, also the second tribe has been uh, working hard with us. This is the measure of the Z mass. I take again the picture that uh, John Ellis showed for shop uh, anniversary. Uh, you see the measurement of the Z mass by this polarization was quoted already this morning also by uh, Italo. Needed to measure the beam and using the polarization that is accumulated by depolarizing the beam and the precision came out to be eventually 0.1 MeV but uh, the limit we had before, we thought we could reach at maximum was 10 MeV. Imagine that. It was a factor of 100 better than foreseen. And uh, of course, you have heard from Steve uh, this morning all the, the story of the train, of the tides, and all the rest. All is linked to the story, which there was a really strict, a strong connection between machine experts and experimentalists. And also, I must say, experimentalists did not only write down what they saw, as uh, he was saying. We didn't only write down. We did a lot to improve the techniques. And here is a table prepared by Daniel Trey, a, a, one of the prominent members of Delphi, in which he compares the expected error before the startup on various quantities to what we achieved eventually. You see, the mass of the Z was written in these yellow books, 50 to 20 mV accuracy. It was 10 times better. The mass of the W, 100 mV, was three times better. The number of neutrinos, to 0.3 accuracy, three point, and in fact it was 0 0.008, and so all the rest. And so this is the contribution of the experimentalist to these achievements. They were the machine experts, they were the theorists, but also we did much better than simply, as Vicky said, write down what we saw. This is a final picture that everybody shows. You don't have to look at this number, just to say that uh, uh, at the end of all the analysis, which uh, the machine stopped in 2000, but it took a few years, this was the status of all the measurements of the electronic measurements of the standard model. You see very small errors. And uh, these are the, uh, you make a full fit with the standard model, which comes out very good. There are two measurements which are not fitting very well. And in fact, one is coming from LEP, which is an asymmetry in the B system. There's all this B, all this B work which are most important, and uh, a measurement uh, related to the polarization which uh, in the machine of slack could be given to the beam, longitudinal polarization in the collision of electron positrons. So this, you see, I have a pool that is, they differ by almost uh, 2.5 and by 1.8 standard deviation, one and two, with respect to the average. There is a marginal disagreement. It is new physics. Nobody knows. Maybe yes, maybe not. But apart from that, everything is OK. And uh, the status of the precision measurement in 2003 confirmed the standard model at the per mil level. The standard model is, in my book, is summarized by the standard picture. There are six works of different colors, neutrinos, leptons, which are metaparticles, and force particles, the gluons the intermediate bosons and the photon. And this has been confirmed by the four experiments. You see, we call ourselves ADLO, Aleph, Ad, uh, Aleph Delphi, L3, and Opal, when every, uh, all together we call us ourselves ADLO, collaboration of the second order, uh, have achieved uh, in the, what we call the electronic sector. Moreover, moreover, we have also measured the masses hidden in the quantum loop. When you have a, a Z boson or a W boson, from time to time it can emit an X and reabsorb it. And this shifts a bit, a bit the mass of this particle. And these are hidden radiative corrections which have to be computed. And they are connected with the names of Toft and Weltman, which, uh, who did the theory behind it, but I don't go into detail. So I give you the numbers which, uh, by measuring very accurately all these quantities, you can see and put and measure things that you don't see but are virtually present 
around the particles that you actually measure. And in 97, before they discovered the top quark, I found this were the limits. The mass of the top was predicted 178 plus or minus 20 by LEP without seeing it, without seeing it. Uh, the number today is 173, and the mass of the Higgson was predicted to be 150 minus 15 plus 150 GV, and uh, uh, nowadays we know very well it is 125. It was actually four years before. See, uh, this is, uh, I, I looked at the numbers in 97. 94, actually. Already this number so precise? Yeah, and, uh, and the discovery as well. Why in sense? What discovery? No, I look before the discovery of the top. That's right, that's right. Uh, so probably it was 94. I looked 94. a bit. That's okay. Uh, so I, uh, was, I took what was before, because then you introduce the top mass and then all the errors collapse. But that's not interesting, because not lap any longer contributing. That's my, so I mean, maybe I wrote down uh, 90, 97. I thought it was 97. Now, uh, now I have to talk about uh, two subjects. I have still a few minutes. Uh, which I want to talk, uh, touch because they are uh, very important. One is the unification of the forces, and uh, the other one is, of course, the Higgs discovery, which something has been said already this morning. So I spoke about the electroweak sector, now I go to, uh, and I spoke first about quantum dynamics, electroweak sectors, and I'll speak about the unification of the forces. Now, as I showed, told you before, uh, uh, once you increase the exchange energy or momentum of a mediator, whatever it is, you change the energy which is existing for a short while, and this modifies the value of the coupling constant because parties can be created. We can be created with energy. If the energy is low, only light quark anti quark pairs can be done, and if the energy is larger, then you can create larger because the Q is larger, you can create larger particles. And there are three types of mediators, as I showed you before. The gluons, the intermediate vector bosons, electroweak, uh, the weak force, and the photon, which together are, of course, forming the electroweak sector. Now, once you increase very much this energy, you can ask yourself, could be this pair of these new particles, so-called supersymmetric particles, which the theorists tell us should exist because of very general constraint and uh, elegance of the theory. There is a theory that tells you that the standard model is only a small fraction of the totality of the reality, and there is another great number of particles, supersymmetric particles, which help theory to make their theory more stable, less divergent, but I don't want to go there into this, is the reasons that I leave to them to say. They propose these supersymmetric particles, which have a very definite structure. Every particle has its own supersymmetric particles, and so from 36 they become twice that. And uh, they have to have a larger mass because they have not been observed. So if you want to, have, to see their virtual effects, you must go to larger to larger energies exchanged or created. And so the question is, can we see through the fact that the coupling run, because due to this fact, clearly, the coupling is not a constant with the Q, but changes with the Q, can you see uh, the effect of supersymmetric particle? And now, uh, since this uh, concerned myself, I've decided not to show you my picture, but I show what John Ellis has uh, presented in this uh, same uh, seminar on the September 24. This is what he showed. Susie Guts. Do they exist a grand unified theory in which, uh, which uh, are unified because of the presence of this uh, symmetry, supersymmetry, and so the existence of these new particles of larger mass? And he said the precision electroweak measurements and QCD, which I summarized before, test, can test the grand unified theory. Ordinary goods fail. And he showed this graph, which has been published in 91 by myself, De Boer, and Fustenau, which has become quite known, in which we plotted 
as a function of the energy, the scale Q uh, in 10 to the 3, 10 to the 17 GV, the inverse of the uh, coupling constant. The inverse makes such that this is a simple extrapolation, theoretically is easy, uh, easy. It is computable. And uh, we saw that if we use ordinary goods, guts that is extrapolating what exists, they fail, they miss each other at high energy. Instead, if one introduces what is called, what's called, still called the minimal supersymmetric model, which means adding supersymmetric particles in an energy range which is suitable, and we try to find what is this energy range, then you can get a convergence. And so data may be consistent with Susie Gertz. And he concluded that, of course, for the moment, everybody knows that uh, we would have expected to see these particles at the LEC, but we have not yet seen them. So this is the picture, but to explain it a bit better, I write more what is written. And so you see here is the inverse of the coupling constant. This is the strong force. The fact that it goes up means that it becomes always feebler, as I've shown you, because it's the inverse of the coupling. Then there is the pure weak force, which uh, is getting also a bit feebler, but less. And then the pure electromagnetic force, which is getting stronger as soon as you go to high energy. And they miss each other if you suppose that there are no other particles than the one of the standard model. Even if you produce all these particles, they go straight and they will not fit. Instead, if you assume that there are particles in the range which is going between 300 and 3,000 GV, these new particles of the supersymmetric type with the right number and the right couplings, which theory tells you, then you can get a convergence at 10 to the 16 GV. And so this has been considered at the time, in 91, as an indication, not a proof at all, that Susie could be there. The graph has not changed. Yes, in fact, it has changed. We have done it many times. Here I put down uh, the status of this graph, I mean, uh, in detail, as Wim de Beer describes in a paper which has been written by the volume, for the volume which uh, Schopper and Dilel are editing on the 60 years of CERN uh, discovery. But anyway, the principle is the same. No supersymmetric particle has yet been found. This is one of the hopes of the next run of large hidden collider, or that minimal supersymmetric model is not right and there is different model which makes a unification, or that there is no unification of the high energy. But this has been certainly an important result coming out from uh, the lab uh, uh, analysis data more than the lab physics. Finally, in search of the Higgson uh, at lab. Well, the long story starts uh, with Emilio, Philippe, Herbert, and Chris. I mean, I'm very happy Philippe is there. This is Herbert Langler, and this is Chris Benvenuti. And uh, I owe to all this, John, this memorandum, you cannot read it, is 11-12-1978, written by Philippe and Herbert to Adams, tentative program for studies of superconductivity in view of lab applications. This was, I didn't know it, so I put it down, it was, uh, John Ellis showed it to me. This was 11, 12, 78. And now I want to tell you something because this is also related to myself and my father. Because Emilio, and I checked this this morning with Philip to be sure, was interested in superconductivity and in cavities, not at all for lab. He got interested in studying superconductivity in cavities because discussing with my father, who was working on the gravitational wave, as the people around here know very well, with this antenna which was uh, installed in CERN, got the idea, talking to Luigi, who is there, to use a superconducting cavities with very narrow band as a detector of gravitational wave. And so he wanted to make a very narrow band uh, resonator of small dimensions, eh, the, am I right? Uh, to make, and this had to be superconducting. And so he got interested in this, and so started to talk to Phil, and you talk with Os Weniger, if I'm right, and so on. And then the story started, and this was the origin for which started the idea of developing superconducting cavities. Just to say how fundamental physics uh, is coming always along a path that you cannot recognize. And of course, you know that uh, this has been essential to increase the energy because electrons in this circular machine, as has been said, radiate photons, and you have to supplement 
this energy at every turn, 3.5 GV every turn at, uh, at the maximum energy. And the energy history of the Ixon search and lab for me goes like that. After lab one, we had a limit of 633 uh, GV. But then around 1990, Daniel Trey started to speak about the fact that the mass of the Higgs would be, and he had some argument to say uh, in an experiment, 2E minus 100 GV. This was, uh, he said it the first time I found it in Karasarej with this uh, in a lecture in Karasarej. Then in 1994, maybe I'm wrong by one year, maybe, the minimal standard supersymmetric model people decided that, uh, and the people have done theories, of, that uh, there was an upper limit to the mass of the uh, Higgson of 130 GV, more or less at that time. And so it's clear that if you take this formula, you take this formula, you need 230 GV to discover the Higgs. And that was an argument that was made and made, and there is, there is, this was quoted also, by, I think, by uh, John Ellis, a paper or a document by Steve and uh, Carlo Viss, in which one was speaking about 384 superconducting cavities instead of 285, which were foreseen. And, uh, this was in this moment, in 96, that the management decided not to continue to produce the cavity. And this made Emilio very mad. I, met, I remember to have met him in the canteen, and he was really furious for this decision. I can say he was very wise. He was right to be furious. Many were. Daniel Trey was as much. Uh, I was saying that at that time, I had already, unfortunately, unfortunately changed my interest. So I was following not very in detail, I was working already on the medical accelerator in 96. Anyway, this is a decision which was taken, and this has determined all the rest. Because uh, here is the story which has been already shown how the energy and the luminosity, is the number of events, went up from uh, 96 to 2000. You see, this is the last year with the energy pushed up to almost 209. 2E was 209, but m most of the energy uh, was 206. Or seven, between two or six or seven. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we had developed the bit tagging capabilities of our detectors. We knew very well how to distinguish B from others. And since the X goes in BB bar, that was very important to discover if it was an X discovery. So uh, Daniel Trey modified his formula from 2E to minus 100 to E minus MZ, which is uh, 90. And so we were being limited up to 115 GV. So that's the reason for which we didn't have the 384 cavities. The formula, which was then eventually applied, giving us this limit. And then the story, you know very well, was already said this morning very well by Steve. Aleph had a three candidate at the end of November, beginning of November, Delphi zero, L31, Opal zero. And at this moment, uh, a decision had to be taken. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, I, mean, I have this occasion to finish because I want to finish reading you a piece uh, which has to do with this decision. Because uh, Steve did not say this. It was Luciano Maiani who took this very difficult decision, certainly. And he wrote a piece on it in Italian because he has written a book with uh, Romeo Bassoli, some of you know him, unfortunately he's no longer with us, he was a great man working in the communication office of uh, and the Acaccia del Bosone di Higgs. And uh, in my book, I've translated in English, so I can read it in English. I read this piece because it's very beautiful. Luciano writes, 10 years later, it was necessary to kill Lep, the king of CERN, to build the large giant, the large hidden collider. I did it. There was much stress, which I feel as a right. It was really a transition drenched with great emotion, as well as a stubborn exercise of rationality. Lorenzo Foa and Gigi Rolandi from CERN urged me in a letter to prolong further the life of LEP. I could answer them with some justification. The chance of finding ourselves by early autumn of next year still with only three, 3.5 sigma is not at all negligible. I explain it in the answer to my colleagues. In a limited time, no more can be done. Or must we think of continuing for two years? At this point, we would have spent all our financial reserves, time and credibility on a very, very risky bet. 
I never, I've never cared for poker. He continues, but I cut it here to say how difficult must have been for him this decision. By the way, I also call him by night, trying to push him, but I think it's interesting to know a posteriori what happened, and uh, I think maybe it was also good because LSE got his triumph by discovering the Hicks. Not like maybe. The for sure it has been a good decision, right? Yes. Yes. It was a good decision. Yeah, sure. And uh, I finish with this picture by Gilles Forconi, who was working for LSE, which uh, describes in this way the startup of the four experimental lab, all running in competition and trying at the end to arrive to a Higgs, which instead uh, was not uh, fortunately reached because it uh, opened the way to the discovery leg. So, in conclusion, thanks Emilio for your friendship and for the intellectual pleasure lab gave to all of us, accelerator physicist, theorist, and experimentalist. Thank you very much, Hugo. Comments? You want to make a comment? Please. <coughs> Oops. Yes, there. Please, please. You are welcome. You are welcome. It will be very short. <laughs> you are welcome. The first one is the results which, which uh, Hugo showed about the meeting of the coupling constants. To my mind, as far as I know, is the only indication from experiments we have now that there's some new physics behind beyond the standard model. I think there's no other indication. Uh, unfortunately, the, where that happens, this change of the coupling constants is not known well enough, so we don't know whether that will change within the reach of LHC or not. It will be very interesting to find out. Second comment. I uh, think, uh, well, uh, no, uh, what was I say? Well, well uh, I skip that comment. The last comment, I think it refers not only to, to his talk, but to all talks this today. I think we have neglected one point. CERN was founded after the war, not only to promote science in Europe, but to bring nations together after the war, science for peace. And that, I think, cannot be pointed out strongly enough. I think, I cannot give a special example where Emilio was involved, but I know that it was very much at his heart. And uh, I think this uh, tendency to bring, bring, bring people together was uh, continued also at the lab experiments, is continued now at the LHC experiments. For instance, to give an example, in the lab experiments was the first time that Chinese physicists from mainland China and from Taiwan were working together which was possible only with approval from the highest levels, of course. And it was also the first time that the US has provided essential uh, uh, contributions to experiments, to a project which was not at American soil. So I think that also continued this tradition of CERN to bring people together. Thank you. All right, thanks again, Hugo. Uh, now I call Luigi to come and give his contribution. Meanwhile, I say only a few words about, you can come, please. I say only a few words about him. In fact, it has already been said this morning that Luigi was the director right before Emilio. He has been uh, the man who was most active in promoting the call of Emilio to the Scuola Normale, as I guess he will say. And I think that I can say that he has been, uh, fr from some point on of the life of Emilio, one of his closest friends with uh, I think I can say probably daily contacts. As, or almost daily contacts, as Mariella can testify. Uh, a 
bit told that I have to speak Italian. Uh, you need a mic. Ah. Ah, that one is, is that working? Devi schiacciare. Forte, perché altrimenti non si accende. Ecco, ecco. Is it better now? Yeah, it's working. It's working. Okay. Yes. I've been told I should speak uh, Italian. So by you, uh, I obeyed. Uh, I prepared it. It partly started in English and then was translated into Italian. So it's, it's a mess. Uh, well, I apologize. I have nothing seriously nothing serious to tell you. I have a, a long association, I had a long association with Emilio, uh, but uh, I cannot contribute anything to the understanding uh, of his work at LEP and uh, all Mi dispiace, questi sono arrivati al momento. Uh, avete mancato un, un lungo discorso e completo di dati prima. Adesso accontentatevi di quello che vi do, cioè praticamente nulla. Dunque, sono... Credo interamente responsabile io di aver portato uh, Emilio alla scuola e non so neanche perché lo feci, uh, perché è difficile immaginare due persone più diverse, più diverse di Emilio e di io, proprio non c'era nessun punto in comune. Eppure siamo diventati buoni amici e restati tale per molti, moltissimi anni. Non so quanti, ma molti, molti. Emilio era fondamentalmente un ottimista su tutto. Eh, specialmente sul suo lavoro. Se cominciava un lavoro doveva essere un successo e quindi era un successo. Poi era un pra pragmatico, voleva occuparsi di cose che poteva risolvere rapidamente. Veramente il lab non è stato tanto rapido, ma è stato il suo momento di gloria. Io invece sono sempre stato eh, pessimista, radicalmente pessimista nella mia visione. If something can go wrong, it will. Eh, però non ho potuto cavarmela. In seguito, beh, anche la nostra preparazione era stata completamente diversa. E venivamo quindi da, da mondi diversi. Emilio veniva da Genova, era, eh, a quell'epoca Genova funzionava molto bene, credo che funzioni ancora, ma non ho perso contatto. Eh, era ben organizzato sotto il, la direzione di, di Occhialini, ma non Occhialini che nessuno di voi ha conosciuto, Occhialini il, pa, il padre di Beppo, eh, che era un uomo notevolissimo, 
e ha organizzato la scuola ottimamente. Poi ha completato la sua preparazione di fisica andando a Boston. No, ma che Boston? Bristol. Bristol. È stata a Bristol eh, non so quanti anni e non so bene cosa abbia fatto. Si occupava di raggi cosmici che con quel aveva avuto il premio Nobel e, e lì è stato a, finita la sua istruzione io invece venivo dalla scuola ma avevo messo sgangherata ma poi eh, mi è stato cambiato in meno organizzativa meno significativa della scuola di Torino. Eh, sgangherata andava benissimo, ma e Torino era dominata dal corso di fisica sperimentale, si diceva a quell'epoca. Eh, era dominata da un professore il quale pare forse un no ottimo musicista uh, questo non posso dire uh, forse lo era certo il suo nome non incoraggiava molto si chiamava Pochettino e Fermi non era maligno ma cioè, era un nome troppo grande per lui e, vabbè, e quindi non mi ha formato per niente, no, non devo nulla a lui, ma riconoscente mi faceva alzare presto la mattina. Vabbè, eh, siamo diventati amici con Emilio e abbiamo preso l'abitudine di telefonarci alla sera dopo cena con scarsa soddisfazione credo di Mariella, ma insomma... Eh, perché la menavamo per le lunghe eh, eh, sì. e una e mi ha detto una cosa ah grazie Emilia in una di queste conversazioni eh, notturne mi ha detto che da giovane, cioè prima di in quello che era il liceo, che lui ha frequentato ma malamente, ma lì a quell'epoca si era preso una, un ballon per la, la filosofia. Ora, non mi ha detto perché poi ha abbandonato questa idea e si sia dedicato alla fisica sperimentale. Eh, Devo dire che non credo che la, questa deviazione filosofica abbia avuto nessuna influenza sul pensiero di eh, Emilio, che era no, non, proprio la parola filosofo non si adatta a Emilio. Eh, Però aveva un, una dote incredibile di farsi degli amici. E, sì, eh, peggiore sono stato io, probabilmente, ma lui vedeva una persona, immediatamente decideva se merita a perderci tempo o no. Sono lieto che eh, mi abbia approvato in qualche modo. Eh, però dove siamo diventati, eh, dove io l'ho conosciuto, una sorta di microcosmo del eh, metro di lavoro 
di Emilio Alep, che era il macrocosmos, era a quell'epoca. Dunque, l'idea era, c'era un centenario, perché non avevo abbastanza libri a casa, e non ho trovato bene perché c'era un centenario di Planck. Non so bene cosa fosse, nell'epoca in cui eravamo assieme. E beh, non credo che Emilio fosse un competente di Planck in nessun modo. E neanche avevamo dei gusti storici, ma insomma ci siamo messi in mente che bisognava fare un centenario, per organizzare un una festa per Planck l'abbiamo fatto e io per fortuna conoscevo un fisico fisico storico della fisica tedesco estremamente competente di cui non ricordo il nome eh, che ha subito accettato è stato Charmé da Emilio subito accettato di fare la pièce de résistance per un convegno un convegno che è andato bene eh, c'era diversa gente eh, fra l'altro anche di un certo numero di letterati con mio stupore Per lui era facile entrare in, com, in, in simpatia con le persone. E aveva uno charme che è incredibile. E cosa che di cui ero, tutto, ero e sono totalmente sprovvisto. è riuscito a farsi accettare in un ambiente poco recettivo, devo dire, e l'ho provato io che non ero normalista e mi sono, sono introdotto in questa eh, sorta di ambiente raffinato eh, in cui io ero proprio indegno, ma insomma... Fra gli studenti di fisica ha avuto un successo enorme. Eh, tu non c'eri, eh, Italo, eri già uscito, credo. Ma insomma, fra gli studenti di, di fisica ha avuto un successo enorme. Credo in parte perché hanno subodorato che gli avrebbe aperto le porte del ser eh, e, e cose che ha fatto vero ne ha arruolati un bel numero di normalisti e eh, normalisti di qui qui della normale ma anche qualcuno di, in Svizzera a Ginevra era al corrente di tutto quel che succedeva all'epoca fino all'epoca in cui è diventato direttore della scuola che ha fatto bene, con gran successo tutti erano uh, persino i più austeri cultori delle memorie eh, normalistiche eh, hanno ceduto a lui eh, e la, gli, sono stati estremamente cor, cordiali con lui no. e io, 
molto più che con me naturalmente. Beh, poi però a un certo momento eh, era direttore, ma a un certo momento ha capito che eh, nonostante tutto neanche lui poteva fare, fare due cose, fare il direttore della scuola e il direttore, il, occuparsi a pieno tempo del LEP. Neanche lui si è spaventato, perché, perché credo la prima volta in vita sua. Eh, ha accettato, ha capito che bisognava puntare sul LEP e ha accettato subito con entusiasmo la de, l'offerta di diventare direttore eh, e lì si è aperto il suo, le sue capacità di grande ingegnere un ingegnere grande ne ha conosciuti due in vita mia forse due o un terzo il grande ingegnere eh, non è quello che, che materialmente fa le cose, quello è lasciato alla bassa forza dei laureati in ingegneria. Il grande ingegnere, quello che fa è... Oh, damn it. Quello che fa è di avere una, gran, una visione grande della, delle potenzialità del progetto che ha. E, e poi e capacità di dividerlo in pezzi e dividerlo in pezzi affidandolo a gente di cui il grande ingegnere si fida completamente e Emilio aveva questa capacità di grande ingegnere eh, ci si è messo anima e corpo in, tutti sapete Cosa ha fatto? Lì, sì, sì, ho finito, signore. Ehm, C'è stata una celebrazione ufficiale per la fine dell'EP che lui, lui si vantava di aver portato a termine nell'EP nel tempo che si era dato. Ehm, doveva essere pronto per un dato. Per... E non so se abbia cominciato in a invitare la gente per l'inaugurazione ufficiale, cioè è venuto lì grandi, grandi personaggi della scienza, di tutti, e della, della politica anche. E a Emilio devo dire che gli è piaciuto moltissimo, eh, è stato molto... Eh, Generoso, ha dato tutti i riconoscimenti necessari al gruppo grossissimo, grosso per allora, eh, al gruppo di fisici che si occupavano del CERN, ha segnato, ha segnato eh, discusso eh, in dettaglio quel che doveva fare, poi lo lasciava fare seguendolo da, da vicino ma no. tutto andava bene eccetto che dopo quella grande celebrazione Emilia era come un pallone sgonfiato cosa fare? non si poteva fare un altro lap subito eh, il prossimo passo eh, no, per quanto ottimista forse non poteva neanche pensare di essere lui a farlo e quindi pallone sgonfiato alla ricerca di un lavoro non c'era cassa di, di integrazione al SER credo che non ci sia neanche adesso e eh, 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 se guardate intorno cosa fare? Gli è piaciuto, ha avuto una, 
Und ähm, Baum. Und äh, Desiderio di occuparsi di cosmologia. Eh, non sapevo eh, che il primo eh, problema di uno che vuole occuparsi di fisico, di fisico, fi, 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 eh, di cosmologia quello di andare a, a seguire quello che fa. Il primo notizio, insegnamento che dava Frank Yang a, a chi si metteva per quella strada. Cioè, si ricordi che il nostro cervello cioè, è, è limitato. Più di tante informazioni non ci sta. Quindi è inutile sperare che di risolvere i problemi cosmologici. Certo non saranno risolti da uh, un omino o donnina, scusatemi, uh, uh, quindi anche quello gli è sfuggito ma soprattutto gli è sfuggito. Era entrato, era finita la primavera, finita l'estate, stava finendo anche l'autunno per lui. È stata una... un periodo triste per, per Emilia, molto triste. Per fortuna che aveva l'aiuto e la comprensione di Mariella, che è stata qualcosa di incredibile. Si è occupato di questo marito che, che evaporava, eh, sfuggiva completamente a, al suo aiuto. E Mariella è stata esemplare. Eh, un esempio che mi ha molto impressionato. Vabbè, è finito così. E per me è finito un, un grandissimo amico. Grazie di tu di avermi ascoltato. Come... Ho scritto qualcosa ma poi non ho seguito per niente, ho fatto un pasticcio. Grazie, grazie di tutto. Chi è lì non vedo? Bene. Chi? Ah, Paolo. Ah, Paolo. Sì, sì. Allora, eh, eh, il programma ufficiale è finito. Scusate, il programma ufficiale è finito. Ma eh, adesso è il momento per tutti quelli di voi che vogliono eh, aggiungere qualche cosa, diciamo, in qualunque senso, eh, siete benvenuti. Eh, magari potete o venire qui oppure aspettare che vi diamo il microfono. E, e... Prego. Gigi. Beh, io di Emilio, con Emilio ho avuto moltissimi contatti per, per, per diciamo, la preparazione e l'approvazione di Virgo. Eh, Emilio è stato un, un elemento fondamentale perché eh, oltre che essere una persona molto speciale era anche molto ben visto e ben amato da, sia dall'INFN che dalla Francia perché voi sapete Virgo è un progetto italo-francese. E quindi posso dire di aver passato lunghi periodi a discutere con Emilio e di lui eh, ricordo sempre la gentilezza e l'affabilità e la capacità di, 
di cercare di capire i problemi complessi che, che avevamo durante la costruzione. Quindi eh, ho un ricordo estremamente affettuoso e caldo per Emilio. Io credo di ah. essere eh, quello che lo conosce da più, da più tempo, a parte Mariella probabilmente. Dato me lo merito perché porto lo stesso cognome, veniamo dalla stessa città, poi le mie iniziali sono L e P. Eh, quindi... Era l'estate del 1957, io stavo preparando la tesi, eh, ero a Genova, dove abitavo di, in, quando ero in vacanza, e stavo preparando la tesi che mi aveva assegnato qui presente il professor Radicati, eh, la non conservazione della parità nel decadimento beta. Era il periodo del, insomma, il, c'era stato il lavoro di Li e Yang, gli esperimenti di V, quindi era un argomento molto caldo. E dovevo calcolare eh, l'emissione del decadimento beta con tutte le possibili interazioni che violavano e non violavano la parità scalare, pseudoscalare, vettoriale, pseudovettoriale, tensore e così via. Poi qualche anno dopo è venuto fuori il V-A e io mi sono detto, ma perché ho fatto tutta quella fatica? Eh, C'era solo... Eh, Dunque, era l'estate del 57, preparavo la, la tesi e qualche volta andavo nel, nell'Istituto di Fisica di Genova, nella biblioteca, a, a studiare, a lavorare. E un bel giorno è venuto un, un ragazzo, un pochino, pochino più anziano di me, un pochino meno giovane di me, e mi dice, ma tu c'hai il mio stesso cognome, cognome, è vero, ti chiami Picasso? Eh sì, mi chiamo Picasso, eh anch'io mi chiamo Picasso, Emilio e Picasso si siamo presentati. È stata un'amicizia improvvisa, perché è una persona, come tutti hanno detto, con la quale non si poteva non essere amici immediatamente. La persona che ti mette, ti met, mi ha messo subito, io sono un genovese di quelli eh, timidi, riservati, eccetera, eccetera, mi ha messo subito... A, a, a mio agio. Eh. Questo è stato eh, diciamo, il mio primo incontro con, con Emilio, poi ce ne sono stati altri in seguito. Ricordo, ricordo un'ottima, piacevolissima serata a, a casa vostra in, 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 in Francia, ricordo una bellissima cena qui a Pisa, in quella bellissima appartamento che aveva una vista spettacolosa. E mi ricordo che in quell'occasione mi chiese, ma eh, cosa stai studiando su questo libro? Ma eh, sto, sto cercando di capire che cos'è l'effetto OG, perché mi domando, non si potrebbe verificare se la parità si conserva o non si conserva nella emissione OG? Ah, sì, è eh, bravo, bravo, interessante, interessante. Poi la cosa è caduta lì. Poi, Qualche mese dopo io ho tornato a Pisa, ho incontrato il Rubbia, eravamo dello stesso anno, ho eh? incontrato il Rubbia e ho detto, senti, così cos'ha, ma non si potrebbe provare a vedere, insomma, ha senso vedere se si conserva la parità nell'effetto. Cavolate, cavolate, ormai si sa tutto, non c'è bisogno di fare. Vabbè, chiuso, quindi non l'ho nemmeno scritto sulla tesi. <ride> Va bene, eh... C'è qualcuno che, che l'ha conosciuto prima di me, oltre Mariella? <ride> Grazie. Parlo in inglese, no? In inglese. Come vuoi. Come vuoi. So, I will say a few words in English, so... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, so thank you very much for these uh, nice words for uh, Emilio. Uh, we are very affected, my, uh, my mother and myself, to hear uh, nice words about Emilio, both from the scientific point of view and from the human point of view. So Emilio was very happy to be, um, to be at CERN and was very happy to be at Scuola Normale Superiore. So CERN, outstanding people and big projects and Scuola Normale Superiore, outstanding people and very small, even personal projects. 
So I will, since I am in the academic world, I will say a few words about my view of uh, the particle physics. So when I was small, I didn't understand anything about particle physics, and I was just l looking for, just watching uh, particle physicists uh, discussing about physics and building machines that I could never see or try or whatever. And then when I became older and, and I understood all the, um, the importance of this work, and I'm, today I'm very much impressed. I'm impressed by the, the money you can get, but I'm impressed, first of all, because you, you can, let's say, you're the only discipline where you can uh, discuss around the world and find, find a common subject for all the physicists, particle physicists in the world. And I can tell you that in mathematics, uh, this is not possible, and I'm quite sure that uh, it's not possible in very many uh, disciplines. We have now one of the European uh, flagships at EPFL, and uh, it's one billion, so it's ten times less than the LHC, but there's already war and everything because of this project. So, so you can find, you can design a project for all the particle physicists in the world, and you can find the money a lot of money, you can, you, then you build the machine as expected on time within the budget and at the end you just run the machine and everything works perfectly as expected. So, uh, uh, yeah. so uh, what I would say is uh, long life to CERN and long life to Scuola Normale Superiore. di incontrare meglio qui alla scuola e doveva essere il 75 76 adesso non saprei dire esattamente ma eh, era venuto qui per fare delle lezioni fermiane e faceva lezione dalle 6 alle 8 in aula Mancini io andai lì a questa prima lezione e per me era un'occasione perché avevo visto la sua fotografia su un libro di fisica e quindi ero molto impressionato che una persona giovane fosse già lì in una fotografia dell'esperimento G-2 e quindi avevo molta aspettazione per questa lezione. Sono andato a questa lezione e la lezione era assolutamente superiore a quello che io mi aspettavo. Era molto bella, una lezione sulle oscillazioni del sistema di K e ehm, io non sapevo quasi nulla, assolutamente entusiasmante. Finita la, uh, la lezione, eh, abbiamo fatto un po' di domande, e poi dopo siamo, sono andato a cena alla mensa. Eh? E dopo 5 minuti, 10 minuti, è arrivato Emilio, ha preso anche lui il vassoio alla mensa, si è seduto vicino a me, e abbiamo fatto le 11 e mezza, a mezzanotte a parlare. E io non ho avuto mai il piacere di lavorare con lui direttamente, però dopo quella serata è stata una delle persone che ha veramente dato un'impostazione alla mia vita e tutte le volte che poi ho dovuto pigliare decisioni importanti ho avuto sempre il piacere e l'onore di poter parlare con lui. Quindi è una persona che per me è stata molto importante, sia come, come figura, come, come esempio e con, con affetto filiale, non so come dire. E questo, questo volevo dire. che ho il microfono posso dire un'altra cosa perché per me rivedere il professor Radicati oggi è stato un piacere immenso eh? e il... sentivo Luigi Ettore dire che lui, il professor Radicati ti aveva dato la tesi da studiare e tu stavi a Genova a studiare, io mi ricordo che ero studente qui alla fine del secondo anno era un anno buono, avevo finito tutti gli esami a giugno e andai nell'ufficio del professor Radicati e gli dissi come posso passare quest'estate in maniera professionale Qua. E lui mi diede una sua copia del libro di Dirac eh? e dicendo ma può cominciare a leggere questo. Io a Capri, un po' rilassato, incomincio a leggere questo libro, non capivo niente, <ride> niente, niente via niente, non capivo niente e poi 
quando ho guardato dietro la, sulla l'ultima pagina di copertina, che era stato scritto da qualcuno che al momento in cui lo scriveva aveva circa la mia età o poco più, questo mi ha completamente frustrato. Ho detto, mai più farò fisica in vita mia, non potrò mai arrivare a fare niente. Va bene, quindi professore, grazie a lei, io stavo quasi per lasciare la fisica, ma Fatto bene, no, no, no. non è stato questo. Se, se posso fare qualche commento, anche perché ho, mi è stato detto che stamani io parlavo al vento perché questo microfono non era nella buona posizione e nessuno ha potuto ascoltarmi, non ha perso niente. Ma riflettendo, eh, in fisica, oltre eh, alle interazioni che si osservano direttamente, si dà grande importanza e rilevanza a quelle virtuali fra queste particelle. Allora, non in modo concreto, ma in modo virtuale posso competere con Luigi Ettore Picasso nell'aver conosciuto eh, Emilio prima. E in che modo e perché virtuale? Perché, e l'ho saputo dopo, quando io entrai alla scuola, in in varie occasioni ebbe l'opportunità di interagire con Glauco Gotardi. E chi era Glauco Gotardi? Il fratello di Mariella. E ora, in un certo senso, lo rivedo nelle fattezze fisiche del figlio. Eh, me lo ricordo. Parli del? Del fratello. No, 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 di... Ah, parlo del 53. 53, 54. Eh, ma eh, devo dire, indipendentemente da questo episodio, riflettendo, eh, Emilio e quelli della sua generazione hanno avuto l'opportunità non solo di essere testimoni, ma di essere protagonisti e di partecipare a un grandissimo sviluppo e a un grandissimo cambiamento Vabbè, c'è stato in tutta la società, ma specificamente nel campo della fisica a partire dall'immediato dopoguerra. Eh, io mi ricordo, credo che fosse l'aprile del 1950, che eh, allora io stavo ancora a studiare all'Istituto Tecnico per Geometri, fu dichiarato a Firenze festa. Eh, perché festa? Perché per la prima volta veniva installato ufficialmente eh, l'UNESCO, quell'agenzia delle Nazioni Unite che riguarda eh, la, la, la cultura eh, e, e in quell'occasione eh, c'era una cerimonia in Santa Croce a cui partecipavano tutti questi capi di delegazione e, eh, grande curiosità a vedere, non lo so, gli africani con la pelle di leopardo, eccetera, eccetera, che entravano, che entravano in Santa Croce. Ma poi seppi che in quell'occasione, credo per la prima volta per iscritto, Isidor Rabi propose che l'Europa, nel suo sforzo di ricostruzione, eh, si sarebbe dovuta dotare di un laboratorio comune a vari paesi perché fuori dalla portata delle singole nazioni ma che potesse eh, dare dei contributi significativi a quella fisica delle particelle che si era sviluppata eh, negli Stati Uniti in particolare a Brookhaven, a Berkeley eh, e così via. E quel suggerimento, come sappiamo bene, fu effettivamente seguito e nel 1954 fu creato il CERN. Però qualche cosa si muoveva, era molto importante anche nel nostro Paese, perché già credo dal 1953, sicuramente 1954-1955, era stato approvato il progetto di costruire un elettrosincrotrone. Inizialmente si pensava che l'elettrosincrotrone sarebbe stato costruito a Pisa e eh, la direzione era stata affidata a Giorgio Salvini, che purtroppo 
probabilmente tutti voi lo sanno, ma che recentemente ci ha lasciato a più di 94 anni di età. E eh, Giorgio Servini a un certo momento, nell'estate 54, che mi ricordo, eh, emigrò con tutto un gruppo di, di ex pisani, e ci sono fotografie di questo camion che partiva con, con persone e materiale a bordo eh, per Frascati, dove gli era stata assicurata la possibilità di costruire questo oggetto. Ma eh, questo voleva dire che effettivamente eh, in Italia, contando anche sul supporto e l'amicizia, eh, in particolare per esempio di Bob Wilson, che allora era a Cornell, e si costruiva qualcosa per poter fare della fisica d'avanguardia a quel momento. E devo dire, è rimarchevole, questa, questa macchina entrò in funzione nel 1959 e fu in quell'occasione, fra parentesi, che incontrai Emilio non in modo virtuale ma in modo, in modo reale, perché con un piccolo gruppo di Genova, che era diretto da Alberto Gigli, ma c'era... A Genova allora c'era anche Pancini che, come tutti voi vi ricordate, insieme eh, a, a, a Conversi eh, e Piccioni fece un esperimento assolutamente fondamentale eh, nel periodo della guerra e immediatamente, immediatamente successivo. E, eh, Emilio sta cercando di mettere in evidenza la produzione di, di coppie di pioni con una camera a diffusione che hanno portato da, da, da Genova. Beh, eh, con un piccolo, piccolissimo gruppo, adesso sarebbe microscopico, quattro persone in tutto, di Pisa, che allora era diretto da Paolo Franzini, ci fu permesso di fare una delle primissime esperienze all'elettrosincrotrone. Quindi allora era ancora possibile che persone laureate da pochissimo, potessero elaborare un progetto di un, un esperimento, costruire la strumentazione eh, necessaria, che per certi punti di vista era, si può dire, anche d'avanguardia, seppure eh, relativamente modesta, e eh, fare un esperimento a una nuova macchina e ottenere dei risultati che significavano qualcosa. Ma, quello che significò per me e per molti altri eh, questa opportunità eh, è connesso anche al fatto che eh, a Frascati in quel momento nascevano eh, proprio i primordi eh, della fisica e più e meno, perché Bruno Tuschek aveva proposto di eh, costruire una macchina o almeno un anello in cui questi elettroni e positroni si potessero incontrare e produrre delle annichilazioni. E fu costruito questo anello ADA, che poi diventò ADONE, e che poi è diventato il LEP. Eh? L'origine del LEP eh? la si può tracciare effettivamente in una maniera diretta a questa iniziativa. E mi ricordo Bruno Tuschek che eh, ha studiato naturalmente anche tutti gli aspetti teorici, ci sono effetti specifici negli anelli più o meno che portano il nome di Bruno Tuschek, ma allora passava il suo tempo, eh, nottate intere, a, a scaldare un prototipo di ciambella eh, per Ada per migliorare il vuoto all'interno di questo oggetto. E la mia emozione nel vedere per la prima volta, voi l'avete mai visto un singolo elettrone, proprio di dire ecco qui c'è un elettrone, non due, non tre. Perché in questo anello di Ada, in cui inizialmente si iniettavano eh, gli elettroni, perché poi per iniettare i positroni bisognava spostare lateralmente l'oggetto che era su un carrello mobile, in modo che il fascio di fotoni entrasse dall'altra parte così che potevano girare nel verso, nel verso opposto. Ma comunque un elettrone in quest'anello, se uno guardava longitudinalmente 
tangenzialmente diciamo, all'anello, eh, vedeva la luce di sincrotrone. Magari era meglio non metterci l'occhio, però con un piccolo fotomoltiplicatore collegato semplicemente a un registratore con il nastro di carta, vedeva il livello della luce in questo fotomoltiplicatore. A un certo momento era un certo livello, toc, e poi saltava. Ah, abbiamo catturato un altro elettrone. Poi saltava ancora e, e poi ne perdevi due insieme. Insomma, uno poteva vedere elettrone, elettrone per elettrone quello che succede in un anello eh, che invece eh, al, al LEP eh, direi 10, 10 alla 13 elettroni è eh, una, una bella differenza di ordine di grandezza. E, eh, tutto questo effettivamente eh, era accompagnato anche da un, uno svilupparsi, un risorgere de, degli studi di fisica. Qui, qui a Pisa, per esempio, nel 1955, arrivò in quello che era essenzialmente, dal punto di vista della fisica teorica, senz'altro, ma che comunque anche dal punto di vista della sperimentazione, della fisica sperimentale consisteva solo in due professori ordinari che dovevano servire anche tutti gli altri studenti del biennio propedeutico, anche di ingegneria, chimica, eccetera, arrivò il professor Radicati. E questo fu un cambiamento quantico nella, nel, nella situazione dell'Università di Pisa allora. Eh, perché precedentemente la, la fisica quantistica era rappresentata solo da un corso di spettroscopia che non, che non vi raccomando particolarmente. Ma eh, naturalmente questo ebbe un, un impatto e un cambiamento culturale profondo. E gli shock non sono facili da assorbire, tant'è vero che il mio peggiore eh, eh, voto di un esame eh, fu quello che mi assegnò giustamente il professor Radicati, perché il livello della mia comprensione della meccanica quantistica era veramente meno che embrionale. Eh. Però, eh, diciamo, ritornando, ritornando a Emilio, eh, lui è stato un grande protagonista eh, dello, sviluppo, dello sviluppo del CERN e d'aver saputo eh, mantenere e eh, focalizzare tutta la sua energia, tutte le sue capacità nella realizzazione di un progetto come, come quello dell'EP è effettivamente un, un grandissimo merito. Eh, non molte persone avrebbero, avrebbero potuto fare l'equivalente, specie partendo da una situazione... Eh, sì, che, che, che poteva suscitare qualche, qualche dubbio in partenza, l'ha nominato Herwig, eh, fu designato come direttore del progetto senza avere un'esperienza di acceleratori. Eh? Però ci volevano evidentemente altre, altre quantità, tu parlavi dell'ingegnere in grande, eh, Emilio eh, aveva questa capacità, questa e naturalmente sapeva coinvolgere e sapeva ottenere il meglio da quelli che erano gli esperti veri di, 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 di acceleratori. E in questo modo, mantenendo i, i contatti e riuscendo a rendersi amico a, a tutti, ha potuto fare un'impresa che eh, a priori all'inizio era fuori nelle sue competenze e che però è stata utile per un'intera comunità, anche perché senza l'EP non si sarebbe potuto fare l'HC, ovviamente se consideriamo l'HC già come si spera che avrà altri successi, ma un successo l'ha avuto e questo non, è, non era concepibile se l'EP non fosse esistito, se non fosse stato... Uh, costruito un tunnel che ha fatto, che ha fatto sudare letteralmente eh, non solo quelli che erano lì a scavare, 
ma gli esperti che hanno deciso sul, sulla collocazione di questo oggetto per finire anche a tutti coloro che si sono dovuti esercitare, e meglio compreso, nelle public relations, in modo da poterlo rendere possibile nell'ambiente sociale e politico eh, in, cui, in cui è stato costruito. Eh, e concludo semplicemente dicendo che dobbiamo tutti essere grati a Emilio per questa sua dedizione, per questo sforzo che ha fatto e naturalmente tutti quelli che l'hanno conosciuto per l'amicizia con cui sono stati in rapporto con lui. Grazie, scusate, ho fatto tutto in, in, in questa maniera. Qualcun altro? Prego, Pierluigi, avanti. Sì, ma l'avevamo intuito, l'avevamo intuito. Pier, eh, Pierluigi. No, te, Emilio, siamo stati molto amici, ci siamo conosciuti a Frascati, eh, anni, io ero ancora laureando, stavo preparando l'esperimento su cui poi ci sarei andato avanti, eh, e siamo stati amici tutta la vita, diciamo. Eh, volevo ricordare una, una cosa che Emilio, altre cose che Emilio aveva fatto a Pisa, non per la scuola normale, non per, eh, lui, per la città, perché Emilio eh, al solito si sa fare amici, eh, sempre eh, cerca di mettere le persone insieme. Volevo ricordare un'attività che ha messo su lui insieme a Busnelli e a Pinchera, mi ricordo, che era dei colloqui fra, fra le due culture. Venivano fatte la sera, un gruppo di amici, e qui abbiamo qualche signora che partecipava anche a questi colloqui, che sono stati, credo, importanti per la, per la, per la città, per aprire anche la scuola normale, l'ambiente scientifico alla città. E, e, do, con quello Emilio si è aperto anche una strada nelle istituzioni cittadine, per esempio è stato, eh, ma, manca qui, c'era stamattina Bracci Torsi con la Fondazione Cassa di Risparmio, con cui lui ha avuto sempre molto a che fare, e, e Emilio, eh, ricordiamoci, è stato oltre che strumentale non solo per il eh, Virgo, eh, a cui diciamo, ha, ha partecipato in discussioni di tutti i tipi, e io lo posso dire anche per conoscenza diretta questo, ma anche per esempio con la partenza del 7 Tesla della Stella Maris, che è stata finanziata contro, contro anche il parere di, 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 di altre istituzioni scientifiche che poi sono saltate sul carro del vincitore e le cose sono andate. Molto di quello, del successo di quel, eh, di quel progetto, si deve a Emilio. Quindi Emilio ha fatto anche molto eh, al di fuori di questo ambiente per la città in quel poco tempo in cui lui è stato qui in fondo. Volevo ricordare anche questo. Se non c'è nessun altro, che dire, diciamo, quando io, Italo e Gigi, naturalmente non abbiamo avuto nessun dubbio sul fatto che fosse molto importante per la scuola di avere una, una, un incontro come questo, in onore di Emilio, però naturalmente avevamo dei dubbi sul fatto che saremmo stati capaci di organizzarlo opportunamente, Devo dire che a posteriori possiamo essere soddisfatti. Mi sembra che sia stata una giornata utile per, per tutti noi, che diciamo, insomma, ha chiarito, mi sembra, cose che sappiamo bene. Insomma, il CERN è, eh, è stata forse l'impresa scientifica più importante e più di successo in Europa. Va bene? Eh, alla quale eh, l'Italia ha contribuito in modo molto, molto importante, molto più del rapporto relativo rispetto alle altre nazioni, grazie eh, a, diciamo, allo sforzo di tutti, naturalmente, ma anche in particolare a quello di alcune persone, fra cui sicuramente Emilio e molti altri. 
Quindi se non c'è di nuovo nessun altro che vuole aggiungere niente, io vi ringrazio e ringrazio Mariella e il figlio di Emilio per essere venuti e tutti quanti voi che eh, avete creduto opportuno di ricordarlo in questa giornata.